All right, welcome everybody to the uh, meeting of the regular the regular meeting of the Galt City Council for Tuesday, April the 5th. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic emergency, we have to conduct we have to continue to handle our city council meetings a little differently than we have in the past for the protection of the public and our city staff. I'm now going to ask our city manager, Mr. Hines, to give a brief explanation to the public. Good evening, everyone. Although this meeting of the Galt City Council is being conducted in person, today's agenda states that we are also using audio-only teleconference options, which allows the public to provide live public comment remotely. Members of the public may use the Zoom link described in the agenda to enter the webinar via audio only, and they should uh, be able to use the raise their hand feature option to speak when the mayor announces the time for general public comment or when a specific agenda item is called if your comment concerns an item on the agenda. Attendees should also see a lower hand feature if they change their mind and do not want to speak. Members of the public may also use the call-in feature described in the agenda. You may just listen if you prefer, but if you would like to speak when the mayor announces the time for public comment, you may do so by pressing star nine at that time. We request that all speakers, in person or on the phone, provide their name and address when they are called upon to speak, but doing so is not required. Today's agenda states that residents may submit written public comments via email to pubcom at cityofgalt.org prior to the council meeting, which will be distributed to city council, made part of the official minutes, and posted to the city's website prior to the meeting. Um, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my comments. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any report out from our closed session? Mayor and the public council received information considered items of labor negotiation as listed in the uh, agenda report and the agenda and provided direction. There's otherwise no reportable action. All right, thank you, sir. I will now call the meeting to order. Can I have a roll call, please? Vice Chair Kennedy. Here. Council Member Vandenberg. Here. Council Member Lozano. Here. Mayor Farmer. Here. We now ask everyone to join us in a silent prayer, and um, we are going to do a moment of silence to honor um, one of our fallen constituents, uh, Mr. Bill Forrest, who has passed away, and also to the victims of the tragedy in Sacramento recently. So please join me in a moment of silence and a prayer. Tina, can you please uh, read our replay statement? This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at metro14live.satcounty.gov. Today's meeting will air Friday, April 8th at 9 a.m. and Saturday, April 9th at 9 a.m. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com forward slash Metro Cable 14. All right, thank you. Moving on to item F, agenda approval additions and or deletions. Do I have anything from council? Okay, moving on to item G, public comment. Tina? Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the City Council on non-agenda items. The public comment section is for the City Council to receive comments, except for brief responses to questions. No discussion or action may be taken on any item that is not listed on the agenda. 
Please limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Due to the statewide emergency, public comments may also be submitted as noted above via the options listed on the first page of the agenda for providing live public comment or prior to the meeting via email to pubcom at cityofgalt.org by 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting, which will be distributed to city council, made part of the official minutes, and posted on the city's website prior to the meeting, but will not be read out loud. All right, do we have any public comment this evening? We do have one public comment from Scott Robinson. Okay, Mr. Robinson. story here in Galt, sorry, <laughs> and believe it can be a great benefit in the city and the community. Cannabis is much more than just smoking pot. In the legal market, the majority of products are consumed orally and often at doses that are non-intoxicating. The idea of the lazy stoner is now replaced by the responsible adult who uses cannabis therapeutically for a number of reasons. Reasons like relaxation, anxiety and pain relief, and help with sleep. Not allowing cannabis stores in Galt does not minimize cannabis use. It does, however, force the community to purchase from the illicit market or leave the city and spend money elsewhere. This is a lose-lose for Galt. There are members of this community that have accessibility issues and medical conditions, and they would benefit from having close, excuse me, safe and affordable cannabis access. The city of Galt will also greatly benefit from tax revenue. This is money that Galt is missing out on and money that can be used to help youth programs, parks, and schools, among other things. Helping the community and adding to the city's revenue streams is a win-win for Galt. I have watched many city council and planning commission meetings where the topics of added revenue are discussed and some, often, some options often seem to come with some potential negative impact to the Galt or to Galt, especially when it comes to keeping the small town feeling and integrity Galt is known for. Allowing retail cannabis will not negatively impact Galt and comes with great benefits. Please consider amending the current ordinance so that my wife and I can open a medical and adult use cannabis store here. Give us a chance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Do we have any other public comment? Uh, no public comment. Okay. Do we have any, no, no comment on the phone either? No. All right, we'll move on to item H, presentations. Do we have any this evening? None this evening. All right. At this time, I'm going to ask our uh, public works director, Mike Selling, to come forward and speak. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor and Council. For those who may not have heard, as the Mayor alerted to, alluded to a few minutes ago, uh, we were informed yesterday that Bill Forrest, one of our senior engineers at Public Works, passed away suddenly on April 4th. Bill was a proud graduate of UC Berkeley where he obtained his bachelor's degree in forestry. Go figure. Uh, that was in 1985. He then went on to complete a master's degree in civil engineering in 1993 and then started working for the county of Sacramento where he worked uh, for about 13 and a half years. Subsequently in that time, he uh, achieved his uh, engineering license in 1997. Uh, before coming to the city, Bill worked for, uh, well, I noted he worked for the county, uh, but when he was at the county, he kind of became the stormwater uh, drainage guru. Uh, he was well revered and, and people uh, sought him out basically uh, on their projects and things. Uh, so after he came to the city back in 2006, he was here for just about 15 and a half years uh, and was responsible for all aspects of development on the public works side. Uh, he was a stalwart engineer and was a wealth of knowledge for staff, uh, myself included. I think all who knew him would agree uh, that in addition to his engineering skills, he had a sharp wit and a fantastic sense of humor. Uh, that he enjoyed a good IPA only uh, heightened his, uh, his uh, 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 
I guess, value in my book, if you will. So, um, so we'll all certainly miss Bill incredibly, and we want to extend our heartfelt condolences and prayers to his wife, Diane, his son, Liam, and his daughter, Kira. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Mr. Selling. Thank you for speaking on his behalf. And uh, on behalf of myself and the city council, we, we also extend our condolences to his wife and his children. And I'm sure he will be sorely missed uh, in our city. In our city. Thank you. Would any of the council like to say anything before I move on? Moving on to item I, reports by city council members on regional boards, commissions, and committees. We'll start with the vice mayor, Mr. Sindhu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on this uh, regional committee, okay, I, uh, I just attended South Sacramento Conservation Agency Joint Power Authority on March 28. Uh, we did discuss a lot of things, but uh, uh, I, I believe there's nothing to belong to GALT. And the only thing uh, is came from the executive director. Uh, we still uh, what will meeting continue because some of our director, they have to meeting in Sacramento just only. These meetings is just 30 minutes, so they try to keep in continue on video. So, Next meeting will be on May 23rd. I will report back to you whatever happened on uh, that meeting. And I also join a public safety committee meeting on March 28th. Uh, the chief, uh, he gave the presentation on get involved cult. Uh, he was giving very good presentation. The second thing we discuss, update on bylaws, uh, Council know we approved uh, uh, a few couple of council meetings. And third thing we discussed normally, uh, traffic concern, stop sign, uh, you know, speed bumps, uh, speeding, all this we discussed. And chief was there. And he may be discussed with the uh, city manager. Thank you. That's about uh, the meeting. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Papineau. Unable to make the Metro Air Quality Board meeting on short notice, and I think Council Member Vandenberg filled in for me on that. Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing of significance or anything at all to vote. They did discuss uh, uh, electric cars and hydrogen fueled vehicles. Uh, even you would not, may not imagine, but uh, taking a train. Uh, engine, converting it to a hydrogen unit and using it in practice uh, and larger vehicles, semis and stuff seems to be uh, the trend, not so much vehicles, but that's mostly what was discussed. All right. Thank you, sir. Councilman Lozano. Yeah, I attended a SACOG board meeting um, on the 17th, and uh, there we discussed the um, U.S. Department of Transportation releasing a funding opportunity um, as it is connected to the uh, Rebuilding American Infrastructure and with Sustainability and Equity Grant Program and talked about how that was going to affect our area and what we could do in our um, public works and community development uh, departments to seek that money. Um, the it, we can apply for it directly from the city. Um, the approach that SACOG is trying to take is to uh, consult with each other and put good projects forward. And uh, so we're going to um, be working with our SACOG partners and county partners to uh, see what might uh, come of that. Um, much of it is going to be uh, based on green zones, which a few years back we approved uh, almost our whole city as a green zone. And so um, look forward to that. Uh, the other big item was that we approved the MOU with the SACOG Employees Association and uh, adopted salaries and uh, the compensation and benefits for uh, through June of 2027. And so uh, that was a, a probably a year-long process. 
and uh, I think at the end of the day um, that uh, the city or the SACOG staff and employees came to a good agreement that um, is not going to uh, hinder the uh, viability of finances for SACOG, but certainly uh, retention is a huge issue right now with, with any government agency, but I think they've done some things to, to address that. So, um, And then lastly, um, there is a transportation policy committee meeting that I'll attend on this Thursday and then a board workshop uh, all day on Friday for SACOG. And so I'll attend that and report back out on that. Other than that, I have nothing else to report. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, myself, um, on March 16th, attended a CAST meeting. It's the city and schools together. It was our first meeting of the year. It was good to uh, finally meet, and uh, along with our colleagues on the uh, uh, school boards, and come up with some, in some initial uh, um, kind of ideas about some things that are gonna be important, and I look forward to the next one, which I believe is in May. And then I attended the public safety meeting along with the vice mayor uh, last Monday. And as the vice mayor mentioned, we uh, had our usual topics, um, traffic safety being one of them. We also did have some inform informative information shared by um, some members from CSD on uh, response times and some things that came up in conversation. Um, it was very uh, informative. And um, again, I encourage anybody to... Uh, that has concerns of public safety to bring those to comment at those meetings. And then lastly, last night I attended the Galt Youth Commission meeting. Uh, it was um, very nice. We talked about um, some uh, things that the Youth Commission are advocating on behalf. We talked about the results of the um, event at the, at the job fair at Galt High School and uh, the Youth Leadership Summer Retreat, which is going to be in June. So... It was a good meeting, and uh, that is all I have to report on that. Moving on to item J, our information consent calendar. It is recommended that items one through four, <coughs> excuse me, is recommended that items one through four be acted upon simultaneously unless a separate discussion and or action is requested by a council member. Do I have anything from council on the consent calendar? All right, with that, I will be looking for a motion to approve the, actually, do we have any public comment on the consent? No, no public comment. Okay, thank you. I'll be looking for a motion, actually, if should you want to public speak on public comment, you may do so, raising your hand on uh, online, or I think it's star nine on the telephone, and we'll call on you. I'll be looking for a motion to approve the following items. Number one, the minutes of the regular meeting of March 15th, 2022. Item two, receive and file warrants for a period ending March 23rd of 2022. Item three, the treasurer's report for a period ending February 2022. And item four, the approval of the final map and subdivision improvement agreement for Cedar Flats Estates Phase 2. No further, no public comment, Tina? No comment. Okay, do I have a motion to approve these four items? So moved. Second. <laughs> uh, moved by Vice Mayor Sandu, seconded by Councilmember Lozano. Can I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Sandu? Aye. Councilmember Papineau? Aye. Councilmember Vandenberg? Aye. Councilmember Lozano? Aye. Mayor Farmer? Aye. Uh, consent calendar approved 5 to 0. Moving on to item K, scheduled matters, notice of public hearing. Do we have any this evening? None this evening. All right, thank you. Next item, L, from our regular calendar. First item is going to be for our, from our city manager's office. The subject is going to be the appropriation of $800,000 for a vacuum slash water truck and appropriation of $300,000 to consume this community services district. Mr. Hines? Um, he had to step out, so if we just want to take a brief pause. Okay, sure. And again, while we're waiting, if you have public comment on anything throughout the meeting, you can... Uh, Press uh, star nine if you are on the telephone, or if you're in the audience, you can spell out a speaker sheet on the left, right, back, and bring it forward to the clerk.
Again, we are just waiting on our city manager, Mr. Hines, to return to give us the uh, staff report on this item. <clears throat> Mr. Hines, we are ready for your presentation on item L1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, if you would indulge me for a few more seconds, we want to get you an updated version of the resolution that's sitting before you right now. The old style copier. <laughs> All right, as far as our ongoing efforts to address the uh, ARPA allocation that we received. Uh, back in uh, October, we um, presented a, uh, uh, the ARPA item to the council uh, and basically laid out a proposed plan for allocating those dollars uh, for the use here in the city. Um, I'm on page two of four of the staff report. So in September 2021, uh, One-time payments for essential workers of 155000 or 156000 were paid out uh, with council approval of the labor contracts that we did back at that time. On December 21st, the city council adopted a resolution appropriating $506,000 of ARPA funds for pool repairs uh, for the Parks Department. City Council is currently delivering the proposed ARPA-funded litter abatement worker uh, city staff, uh, myself and the Economic Development Director, Amy Mendez, are developing the Small Business and Nonprofits Program. We anticipate those programs will be released in the late spring 2022. What we are proposing uh, before Council this evening is to allocate an additional $800,000 for the purchase of a VACON or vacuum water truck and also to uh, appropriate $300,000 uh, to the Consumnes Community Services District. Uh, Natish Sharma is here, he is their admin chief, and uh, so he's here to uh, present the uh, information on the $300,000. Mike Selling is here to present any information regarding using the ARPA dollars, the $800,000 for a new VACON truck. So I'm going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and start with Mike. Let's go ahead and start with Mike. And since he's got the big VACON truck, and by the way, um, the VACON trucks, because of their size and just, just pure complexity, um, are just a, a, just a fascinating vehicle to, to see. So uh, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let Mike Selling uh, give you more information. Uh, thank you, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, yeah, Mayor and Council, as far as the VAC contract goes, the existing uh, vehicle that we have uh, was purchased in 2004 by the city. Uh, these, these vehicles are basically used for a variety of, uh, of tasks, from uh, cleaning sewer lines to, um, to doing uh, repairs on water lines and, and storm drain lines and whatnot. Essentially, when they open up the road, uh, basically what this machine is is a truck it's got uh, two tanks on it. One is a tank for the debris that it sucks up. Imagine just a giant vacuum cleaner, if you will, something that can pick up chunks of asphalt and rocks and, and uh, you know, sand and gravel, that kind of power. And then there's a, a water tank on it, too, for the, and, and there's a hose reel, essentially, for doing the flushing of, 
of lines uh, on the sewer lines particularly. So this, this is a piece of equipment that's very frequently used because we have to maintain our sewer lines, keep them clear of potential uh, you know, debris in there that can clog up the lines and that kind of thing. And then whenever there's a, a repair uh, that's needed, uh, this is the first piece of equipment on the scene basically. So a uh, very uh, heavily used piece of equipment. And um, I wish I'd have thought to bring you a picture of one, but uh, it's a pretty quick Google. If you, Vacon is actually a brand, but it's kind of one of those like Coke, right? Everybody refers to it and everybody knows exactly, in the industry anyway, they know exactly what you're talking about, whether it's actually of that brand or, or another brand. So um, again, we're about uh, you know two, three years past the service life of the existing vehicle. And we've definitely been you know, having to do some additional maintenance uh, on this piece of equipment. We had planned to put it in uh, the new two-year upcoming budget uh, with the ARPA funds uh, and, and again, the, you know, the state of, re, uh, of condition essentially on our existing unit. Uh, we saw an opportunity to, to maybe expedite that. And then also just looking at the current climate, you know, uh, I think we're all heard, you know, it's starting to get a bit rote as far as supply chain issues and inflation. Uh, so, you know, to basically, if we can expedite the purchase of this vehicle, uh, we can hopefully, uh, you know, get it uh, sooner and also uh, save the city some money uh, as we expect prices will only go up. And of the 800000 we're asking, I would tell you, you know, from our current research that we've done, we expect the unit that would meet uh, our needs to be probably somewhere currently in the 700, 720 uh, range, 720000 um, but however, we're asking for essentially an additional amount of appropriation, not knowing, you know, what inflation might do in the coming months, that kind of thing, because this will take probably a couple of months to take it to bid, and then we would bring it back for council's consideration to approve. So you're not approving the purchase of a vehicle tonight. It's simply just an appropriation of money, so then we can move forward on the bid process. And I'm available to answer any questions. And, and um, I just wanted to add that on page 204 of your staff report, I just wanted to bring to council's attention that we had previously allocated $930,000 for infrastructure and water and sewer. And this uh, vehicle is definitely a, um, a valuable purchase in uh, keeping up that, that infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Hines. <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Selling. So just to be clear for the public, um, on October 5th, we um, were presented with a suggested list of items, um, dispersal of the ARPA funds that the city of Galt received, is receiving, uh, received some and still receiving more. And um, in that dispersal list, um, the council uh, approved uh, initially a 900,000 to go towards public works for um, things in this wheelhouse. And so to be clear, you, had, you guys had previously budgeted this out of your next budget cycle, but you decided to instead use uh, use this uh, lump sum or 800 of this 900 to do that at this time is what you're asking for correct okay do you know what the i mean what the, what is the lead time on the truck do you know yeah uh, it can vary um in talking to the manufacturers and and again depending on what options you're kind of looking at you're probably looking at a 90 to maybe 120 day time frame for delivery okay um that's the only question I have for you, Mike. Um, do any of my council have questions for Mike? Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Selling, just uh, for the clarification, the equipment we're going to buy is the same kind of equipment what we're using, or does it have a bigger capacity than whatever we have? Yeah, great question, Vice Mayor. So this unit, uh, some of the advances that uh, that these um, you know machines have uh, have had since we purchased ours in 2004. Right now, with ours, uh, when the tank gets full of, you know, essentially the water that we've used to, to clean or whatnot, we have to take it out to the uh, sewer treatment plant and dump it. Uh, this new unit has a filtration system into it, so it can recirculate the water. So it, it's basically a lot more efficient. You don't have to, you know, go back and forth to dump it uh, as frequently. So, uh, but otherwise, it's basically, you know, same concept: a giant vacuum if you will, and, and then a um, pressurized uh, water uh, system, hose system for cleaning, so. Oh, thank you, and then uh, next, my clarification. Uh, that equipment might be a year or year and a half if it will come, right, when we order it. And after we get the new equipment, what we usually do with the old equipment, because since that, uh, you know, huge equipment have a lot of uh, prices going up than uh, usual. 
Yeah, I think that is yet to be determined. Um, maybe just a quick clarification on the delivery. We would hope that we would get the new unit probably, you know, in 90 to 120 days from council approval, uh, you know, and that's probably a couple of months out. So yeah, you're probably looking at five, six months or so before we would take delivery of the new unit. As far as the old unit, uh, depending on the condition and what the market uh, will bear, uh, we would at that point look at, um, could we essentially sell it uh, on the secondary market? Uh, the other thing that we tend to face in California is with the air emission standards, you know, always getting uh, more stringent is a lot of times some of these pieces of equipment, even though they're still in good condition, they don't meet air emissions requirements. And so we, we tend to have to um, sell them on the secondary market and they end up going out of state uh, where they, they don't have a stringent air uh, requirements. But that said, uh, the other option is to potentially uh, we may be able to use it uh, further out at the treatment plant, uh, and that would save the new unit from having to go out there as frequently because uh, this unit is basically spending time out on the streets, uh, like I said, doing the repairs and the sewer line flushings, but it also uh, does double duty uh, helping us out at the uh, sewer treatment plant uh, on various tasks when needed. So. so I would say, bottom line, I guess the short answer is, um, to be determined yet, uh, we may want to retain it, but we may consider selling it on the secondary market as well. Thank you. Then uh, next, my question may be uh, with the city attorney. You know, we did uh, uh, last, uh, I think it's $930,000 to in uh, public works department. And they have a certain uh, guidelines to how we use the money. And I believe on the report there is a six guidelines. Uh, which guidelines uh, we are using to use this uh, money uh, for the equipment? Uh, the, 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 the disbursements that were potentially, that council gave direction on in October, they were based upon what subject matters do we want to um, provide funding for. Um, so, example, some of them were nonprofits, some were CCSD, which is also on the agenda tonight. Um, the particular appropriation that the city can use would either be the water sewer infrastructure appropriation category in ARPA or just general revenue loss allocation um, because the city has uh, up to 10 million essentially it can use on general revenue and general revenue loss can be used for any governmental services, which this would apply. So at least two of the six eligible categories would apply here. But I'm talking about this particular equipment. Uh, which category are we going to apply? Uh, Vice Mayor Sandu. So yes. out of the six categories that we see here on the first page of the staff report, yes. this, this, ca this purchase can be categorized as under the sixth bullet, invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So we can use those dollars to reinvest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So this VACON is responsible for cleaning the water and sewer infrastructure. So it, it applies under that category. It also applies under the fourth category, which is the replacement of lost public se sector revenue. Because our appropriation is under $10 million, we have the ability to use these funds pretty much in any way we see fit. So it actually fits two of the six categories. Thank you. That's my question is which one we apply to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody, uh, does any of the council have any further questions for Mike before we um, go on to the, we're going to do this together, the CSD. This is one item, correct? Right, right. And CSD is coming up next. And uh, after, if there's no more questions for Mike. Yeah, real quick. Um, in our prior discussion, the city policy currently is that um, it's our responsibility to take care of uh, sewer problems between property line and the city main. Um, and we talked to once a month or so, or something like that as we hit that. Um, so is this, w would this truck be what would respond each each time to those? Yes, typically, yeah. It's kind of an emergency response vehicle. Otherwise, we leave the right. homeowner sitting uh, on the hook, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's definitely a great question, uh, Council Member. Yeah, this this vehicle is one of the first to respond, essentially, if not the first, uh, other than maybe uh, police or something. But um, 
uh, when there is a water line break, say, or you know any kind of repair that's needed on you know water sewer lines or sewer stoppage, this is you know at least Public Works's first vehicle out there, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have? A, um, I think I'm going to let uh, CSD go next, and then we'll see if there's public comment, and then we'll go back to council for any further discussion. Very good, okay with everybody. Okay, I'd like to introduce Natish Sharma. He is the Chief Administrative Officer for Consumnes uh, Community Services District, and he's going to present, uh, do a presentation on the uh, proposal before you for the allocation of $300,000. Uh, Natish, we're kind of low tech here, so if you could just call out when you want us to uh, advance the slides, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So nice to be in this uh, city hall. It's been a while since I left the last city hall, but special district is a little bit different. So really appreciate being here and be able to provide you a little bit of the update on the opera funds that uh, Kasumna CSD is uh, requesting. And, um, and with your support, we're hoping to move on multiple items that we actually as an agency deferred or um, suffered during the uh, COVID-19. So um, next slide, maybe. Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you? There's. I'm, we're getting like a high pitch feedback from the microphone. I don't know if maybe, yeah. maybe try moving the mic a little bit back from. And maybe just have them. They might have the mic up too loud, but I don't know if anybody can hear it. Right. Is this okay. good? Go ahead. Yeah. Say, say again. Good. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Well, um, definitely. Uh, before we, I go into the uh, the um, subject or in the uh, presentation, just want to present to you our mission and vision as the fire agency and uh, to provide uh, uh, innovative, in in inclusive, uh, intentional um, services to all the citizens that we serve. Uh, next slide. The funding that we're requesting from the City of Galt will address uh, a number of these um, uh, values that the Ximna CSD has, safety and mitigating risk, financial responsibility, high quality workforce, service to the community, and a little bit of the uh, diversity, equity, and access. We'll touch pretty much a lot of these areas. Next slide. So a brief overview, I'm just gonna talk about what um, you know, our response was during COVID-19. A little bit talk about the revenue calculator. I believe you must have a copy of the packet that uh, now, so I'm gonna be walking through um, slowly with, on that. We also wanna talk about the uh, district's fiscal contingency plan. As, as you may have heard in your presentations, the revenue loss is one of the eligible categories for our APA funds. But uh, we as an agency or many agencies, if based on the revenue loss, we had to make adjustments on the actual side. So if we don't have money in our bank account, we can pay for stuff. So we made some adjustments on our actual bank account to ensure that we don't uh, create a, a financial challenge for the district uh, and the resources that we have and the, and the resources that used to provide the services. Uh, we also talk about a little bit about COVID-19 reimbursements that we have received. So just want, want a full disclosure, transparent of the monies we have received and talk about some of the uh, next steps that we're looking forward to. Next slide. So um, COVID-19 response from the district, uh, we were uh, the, the fire department in Sacramento County that uh, were the vaccine hub that um, all the, the regional fire agencies, their, their vaccines were at our location. We managed all the distribution of that. We also um, provided uh, vaccine clinics. We actually did a couple of them in, uh, in City of Galt as well. And all this work was done prior to any uh, regard to the funding at all. We just knew that was the right thing to do. And we as an agency for the City of Galt and then for the City of Elk Grove, we, our board supported our initiative and we provided uh, services to, uh, to many, uh, many um, uh, public safety employees, school teachers and other uh, other individuals that were eligible for it. COVID-19 funding bill, as you are aware that um, the, the APA funding, uh, mo most of the, um, the, the allocation of funding went to the uh, counties, state, and, and, uh, and cities. Special districts were left out of that funding and we are a little bit uh, unique as we have the fire and pox district. We're not just a fire district or just a pox district. And uh, so we were not part of the funding uh, plan until the state of California put together $100 million and then we were eligible for, uh, for some allocation on that. 
Uh, concern with CSD as just uh, the allocation of funding from um, the from the any federal funding, we are basically excluded from that as a special district. Next slide. So you have seen this slide before. Our chief uh, fire chief Felipe Rodriguez uh, presented this slide to you. I won't uh, repeat um, this slide again, but my um, opportunity here is to highlight some of the work we did with uh, and with our partner, City of Galt. Uh, and the Galt Unified um, School Districts to provide uh, COVID-19 vaccines. We did about 2,400 vaccines um, to Galt community, elderly, elderly um, residents, educated, and essential workers. And uh, we also did the uh, vaccine at the Galt flea market, as you could see, uh, about 700. And then you know, um, the police department, we provided vaccine for them as well, as well as El Grove Police Department. So revenue loss calculator um, as one of the eligible um, for reimbursement or uh, for funding is the revenue loss. The Government Finance Officers Association developed a revenue loss calculator. That is this. Uh, it's in front of you, I believe. And if you look at this, um, this report, what you'll see is that the uh, revenue um, reduction for consumer CSD was $17.9 million uh, based on the methodology that was um, uh, that was set forth by the uh, the APA requirements, and uh, today um, we want to present to you that our initial estimate was about 14 million. Then we did the uh, revenue loss calculator as well, 17.9 million, and that's only for general fund. Uh, district wide, we have parks department as well, um, park operations. Our district wide revenue loss calculator was 24.8 million. 17.9 million is what we submitted to the state of California as well as the revenue loss uh, for, the, for the district in order to secure funding from the um, state of California. And also, if you look at your packet, you'll see that um, there's a staff report uh, from City of El Grove attached to it as well. And that includes the same 17.9 million that the City of El Grove used to, uh, to allocate a million dollars to us as an agency. Next slide. Just a little bit on the fiscal contingency plan. This is basically us making adjustment when we, as you may know, that we operate a very large recreation facility uh, and uh, programming. And uh, for us, we had direct, direct impact to our service delivery and our budget. So as an agency at that point, when we, when we, when we the coronavirus um, uh, was emerging uh, at that time, we made adjustments to our budget we basically looked at what can we do as an agency to, um, to monitor our costs, reduce our expenses, and ensure that we don't put district in a financially um, unstable position. We make adjustments in salaries and benefits, um, part-time uh, help that ran at recreation programs, and this was during, actually, at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, March and towards summer when most of the recreation programming are, are happening. We actually... Um, um, did not hire those positions, and us, and we were able to save 1.9 million. We also did a fiscal contingency plan to materials and supplies. Only things that are needed is what were authorized to be purchased. Otherwise, we pushed everything off in order to manage the uh, the cash outflow and the budget challenges. A couple of things that are also important: that capital outlay. We had about. $5.5 million of capital improvements, as you have seen today from Mr. Sellers about the VAC contract and how it was in the next year's budget and moving it up. We also had these items budgeted for, engine 45 and engine 46, 1.7 million, cardiac monitors. This is basically a equipment that is on every ambulance and when, when our paramedics respond and they basically take this equipment and ensure that, that uh, you know, the, the patient is taken care of. So we, we had about $900,000 of cardiac monitors, a letter truck, 1.7 million, and a couple of medic re, uh, replacements of $800,000. There were other things that were also deferred. I didn't list all of them, but just wanted to highlight some of the things that we did as an agency to ensure that how can we mitigate our actual loss. COVID refund, um, as mentioned before, 17.9 million was the revenue loss calculator. We did receive reimbursements from City of Elk Grove. We were, we were also very successful to receive um, a reimbursement from State of California of 3.9 million. 
and um, and uh, we are seeking today uh, funding of three hundred thousand dollars from City of Galt to directly benefit the the things uh, the the stations the service we provide in in City of Galt for example the um, the fire engine we talked about or other things that we we the other two stations the services we provide and uh, capital outlay some of the funding from State of California or City of uh, El Grove is going towards uh, the other items like the um, the cardiac monitors and things like that so that we are directly benefiting the, the community today my goal is that um, to walk through um, any questions you may have from what's been presented we also included a letter that I sent to Mr. Hines the city manager that describes uh, each category of the, um, the fiscal impact, and it also talks about um, the expenditure plan on, um, on the, the things that we, we, we are seeking funding to, to do, for example, um, ambulance replacements um, and some of the other facility type uh, replacements as well. So I wanted to just uh, piggyback on to the presentation. And when we presented this item, um, CSD had not yet received those dollars from the state. And so they were not so much looking, but Elk Grove and, and I felt that we had to find some way to uh, support CCSD during this time. Um, subsequent to that meeting, they did receive $3.9 million. Elk Grove chose to continue their commitment to CSD and give them that one point two, uh, the million dollars that they had initially pledged. Um, I at that time felt that uh, felt that we also needed to continue our pledge to CSD, if anything, to send a signal to our firefighters to let them know that we support them, and that we want to see them to succeed. We want to see them succeed, and um, so I just wanted to make sure council knew that when I had talked to CSD initially, I did get a guarantee that these dollars would be used for Galt operations only Galt fire and medical operations only and mr. mayor members of the council well I'll leave it to you all uh, for questions okay thank you uh, thank you mr. Sharma and, and thank you mr. Hines for adding that <coughs> last bits of information that was actually one of my questions because um, initially I in full disclosure I spoke to city attorney today about a verbiage that I in here and I just wanted to clarify with him uh, in the initial staff report, it said um, that uh, the money was to be for the enhancement of services to Gaul, and I felt the word enhancement seemed a little like I didn't want to. I had a citizen come to me and, oh, we're get, what are we getting new? I was like, well, this is, you know, this is more like to make sure, you know, uh, there's facility ma you know, maintenance, uh, loss of funds. I mean, you know, as he said, it's going to his Gaul, but I it just I felt like the word, and I, I like the word support better. It looks like. Um, in the actual resolution, it looks like the word support is used um, in support of an allocation. So the word enhancement is no longer used in here. So I, I, I like that. Um, that was only a little bit of a, I know it might seem like a small thing, but it just to me, I didn't want to get the wrong impression to the public. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Sharma before I go to public comment? Uh, just only the comment. Uh, First of all, Mr. Sharma, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for giving us a detailed presentation. And your request is a reasonable. I will support that request. Uh, my question was the same thing, uh, Mr. Hines, already clear. I want to make sure the citizen Galt, they understand this $300,000 we allocated, it will be used in the city of Galt. Is that right, uh, Mr. Sharma? Yes. And thank we you. And that's my question was. Thank you very much. Tonight. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Anyone? I have a question, and, and I apologize for not getting with you ahead of time or your general manager, but um, having just received this, question is this. You, you had a slide up there that said one point, I think it was $1.4 million was being allocated to replace two engines. Is that right? Yes, it's it's an allocation, and uh, the three hundred thousand dollars will help us um, with the engine that we we uh, we are in the process of. Um, uh, you know, it takes a year and a half. We made a commitment right. already, so it's going to go towards that. Sure, mm -hmm. and and those engines that were identified as engine forty six and forty five. 
right? Yes, and we have other engines that we also did, but our what we committed to do is that the three hundred thousand dollars we're going to be spent on the the equipment or the services that are in Galt. So, so the total cost of those two engines is one point seven seven million. Yes, and we're we're chipping in three hundred thousand. Yes, got it. All right, and those will primarily work down in the Galt. Yes, er, uh, city, uh, but certainly will. Assist yes, out in the county as well. Our plan is to do both replacements, but initially um, we're going to do one engine, either engine forty-five or forty-six. I'm not sure which one are the more critical one, but three hundred thousand dollars will be put into into the community right away. Okay, thank you. Well, if we have no uh, further uh, questions for Mr. Sharma, I think we will see if there's any public comment before we move any further. Do we have any public comment on this item? We have Bonnie Rodriguez uh, representing Galt Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Rodriguez. Good evening, Council. On behalf of the Galt District Chamber, I was voted this morning to come and speak to you uh, on the ARPA funding. And I uh, would like to start off uh, sending the chambers and my personal condolences to Bill Forrest's family and to the city of Galt and all of the staff members. I know this uh, is a, it affects wide. Um, I do have to be honest as I was sitting here thinking when it was announced, I was thinking, you know, there's always opposition or not opposition, but um, a balance. And Bill had such a deep voice that was very, so someone's gonna have to step up to fill that in the planning meetings and, and these meetings. Um, but I know people are very difficult to replace uh, physically and, and bringing all that institutional knowledge, but um, it's almost impossible to replace them personally, so my condolences. Um, on behalf of the chamber, uh, I'm here to say we are ready to go. And it was great to hear Mr. Hines announce that uh, he and and uh, Amy Mendez are working on a small business ARPA funding program. Um, we have been sitting waiting. We're ready. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Mendez has come and spoke to our office manager uh, and trying to figure out some programs that will be helpful for, this, for the uh, local businesses. Um, I'm excited to hear that funding is being spent because we have 800,000 going toward a truck, we have $300,000 going to CSD, we had the other allocations that happened, so we feel like it's, we're waiting, it's our turn. So we're hoping that the attention that um, was given to these other allocations can now be turned to help the businesses um, you know, our businesses here in town, as everyone knows, has struggled. Um, some have done better than others. Some are still hanging on, on threads. We really appreciate the help that Ms. Mendez has been, and, and other staff members have stepped up. But I know that Ms. Mendez is a kind of an army of one right now. Now it sounds like it's an army of two, if we can get maybe a few other people to help move this along, because our businesses really, really need um, some help. Our Our office worker has been pretty much working more than full time helping people fill out different grant processes and and uh, from all walks of life she's ready to help with this and just so that you know she has over uh, gone over and above what she has been asked to do because she has been helping non-chamber members she has been helping uh, anyone who's come in either called or walked in she's there to all hours of the night helping them fill out these grants she's we're i feel like she's becoming a little bit of an expert so we're ready for the city to send us her grants so we can help everyone so we're waiting you know for this army of two hoping it's joined and we're ready for our marching orders and we hope that it can happen sooner than later because our businesses are still trying to dog paddle up and get their head above water. So hopefully we can uh, get some movement with that as sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and uh, thank you f um, for the condolences from the chamber <clears throat> for Mr. Forrest. Do we have any uh, other public comment? No public comment. No uh, hands raised online or, I'm sorry, on the phone, I guess. Uh, no. Okay. 
Uh, should you wish to comment on this again, um, if you are on the phone, star nine, I believe, to um, be called upon. Um, I just want to say before I go back to the council, um, so looking over, you know, our staff report, everything, um, seeing that, you know, the city of Elk Grove did allocate 1.2 million, it's roughly about 5% of the money that they received from ARPA. The 300,000 that we are um, being asked to give, which we initially were presented with back in October, uh, is about the same. So it, it's it's a fair allocation um, uh, for what we're getting in our total. So, I mean, um, I was happy to hear that that money will be um, used for us, for our city. So I do support um, personally giving the, the 300,000. I think it's fair and it, and it would be um, a good gesture on our behalf. Uh, but with that, I also just wanted to make a comment. It kind of falls in line with actually what <coughs> Mr. Rodriguez said was I was noticing, um, you know, we ha I was attached with our staff report was uh, our old staff report from October 5th, which is six months ago today. And in that staff report, we had, you know, gone out to the community to uh, get input from the community on how they would like to see those dollars spent. Well, the top two were maintenance of repair of city parks facilities, 68%. And uh, a second place was 50% at helping our small businesses. And, and I was not surprised to see that because those are important things to the community and I'm, and I'm glad that we um, are, are set to do that. But I just want to emphasize, which I'm glad um, Mr. Hines made comments to this effect, but I just want to say that we are now six months past that and we still haven't really spent any money on those two top things. With the exception of the pool money, um, to re the pool repairs, but that's still, um, you know, working out some details on that. But outside of that, uh, like I said, I think I think our, our businesses and, and have been more than patient, I feel. Um, and I hear from them. I hear the nonprofits always ask me, hey, when are we going to... I said, we're working on a program. You know, they're working on it. It's, it's complicated. But I just really want to uh, bring that to light that um, we are dispersing money, but I feel like we're dispersing in a kind of a roundabout way and we still haven't really touched on the top two things that were important and it's six months. So I just wanted to make that statement. Um, but I do support the 300, and I do support the uh, uh, if Public Works wants to use their, their, their piece for their truck, then I don't have any problem with that either. So any, comment, any comments from other council on this subject? I, I'd simply like to say uh, I, thank you to you know, CSD for all the support they provide. Um, we're, we're the beneficiaries of, of great support, and it's greatly appreciated. I fully support funding the 300,000. Thank you so much on behalf of the board and uh, the entire executive team and this consumer CSD uh, team. We appreciate this, uh, the support from, um, from each one of you uh, and for our community. Thank you so much. And our city manager as well and our city attorney who is very good. Thank you as well. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, any further, any other comment from anybody in council? Do we have any public comment? Any additional? No additional comments. Okay. Well, with no further comment and no questions from council, we'll be looking for we'll be looking for a <clears throat> motion to adopt a resolution to one authorize an appropriation of eight hundred thousand dollars for the purchase of a vac slash water truck, and number two authorize an appropriation of three hundred thousand dollars allocated to the consumerist community services district to enhance to support. Sorry, I just. Do I have to say that? I mean, I brought up, it's not in the resolution, but it says it on my agenda, so. Yeah, because it was updated. I'm no, not, because I read from the agenda, not from the resolution, so should I read from the resolution? You can just read from the title of the resolution, or you can say approve resolution number, uh, the res resolution authorizing those appropriations as presented. Okay. Um, looking for a, a motion to um, approve the resolution for the two items presented. So move. Second. I don't know who was first there. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, moved by Councilmember Van. Everybody's so fast. Uh, moved by Councilmember Vandenberg is seconded by Councilmember Papineau. Can I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Papineau. Aye. Councilmember Vandenberg. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Farmer. Yes. Resolutions approved. Five to zero. 
And Mr. Mayor, before we move on, I just have one comment. Um, uh, obviously, I'm thankful that we're supportive of those two items. Um, I, too, at the last meeting that we heard uh, the items on uh, ARPA funding spending um, brought up not only the small business issue, uh, the small business uh, impact uh, funding, but also the nonprofits uh, funding. And, um, and I know Mr. Hines has been working on that. I appreciate the work. Um, it, uh, it, 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 but it, it does need to move pretty quickly um, as, as we have those uh, businesses and, and organizations out there that have been continuing to uh, scramble. And so thank you, Ms. Rodriguez, for coming and uh, presenting that. Um, and uh, it's certainly need to move forward. But I think uh, now that we've cleared your plate a little bit and uh, uh, we'll have some time to do that. So thanks. All right, thank you, council member. All right, moving on to item two, also from the city manager's office is the subject is the strategic uh, plan for 2021 through 23 spring update, Mr. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the city's 21-23, I'm sorry, 2021-2023 strategic plan was adopted on January 18th, 2022, not three months ago. Uh, per its adoption, the strategic plan is to be presented uh, to the city council at a city council meeting on a quarterly basis to review our progress to date. Uh, tonight, I will present our progress through the first quarter of 2022. Um, I would refer the reader and the council to the first page of the staff report. As you can see that I've put the 22-24 budget calendar um, on the staff report. I have checked off the items that we have gone through, and that would be the mid-year update and all of the um, ancillary reports. Uh, the 2021-2023 strategic uh, quarterly update um, I've moved that item up from April 19th to tonight. Um, it was ready to go, and I figured let's, let's get it on, um, on the docket, and uh, that way that leaves more room for uh, the narrative budget presentation on the 19th. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like, you to, take, I'd like to take you through our progress thus far. Um, and so I'm going to start on page two of three of the strategic plan, and this is priority, uh, the economic development. And, and, and while we're on that page, I just want to reiterate for everyone listening that our strategic priorities for 2021-2023 are economic development, improving fiscal sustainability, maintaining and improving Galt's quality of life, city council roles, internal succession planning, traffic mitigation, housing, and improving C Street. And so uh, with economic development, um, we have, uh, staff, is currently on, staff is currently researching the feasibility of uh, a development impact fee deferral program to offset the upfront cost associated with new development projects. We anticipate having this rolled out in the next few months, probably in the summer. Um, as far as our, our focus on retail attraction, our um, economic development manager, Amy Mendez, recently went to the International Council of Shopping Centers retail trade show. Uh, during the trade show, she had several meetings uh, with retailers and uh, to market available properties here in Galt. Uh, there was significant entry, uh, interest in the fast, from fast food casual restaurants and retail users for both the 45-acre Simmerhorn commercial property, and the 12-acre uh, site on the SEC of uh, Twin Cities Road and Carillion Boulevard. Uh, we'll be coordinating with the developers of both sites uh, to look at opportunities. The uh, city also approved the Fairfield Residential Project that includes 19,000 square feet of neighborhood uh, serving retail at the corner of Carillion and Walnut. I'm gonna to move to the next priority, which is improving fiscal sustainability. And so the, 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 the um, task there, or at least the task in the, the first on the list is a quarterly reporting and periodic council briefing on revenue sources and expenditure utilization. Uh, Mid-year budget update and the long-term financial plan were presented 
to council on March 13th, I'm sorry, March 15th, 2022. So we've started the process of um, periodic reporting to council. We'll be looking at revenue opportunities um, as we explore the 22-24 budget and that, that will also include uh, optimizing measure R and we'll also be looking at near-term revenue enhancements. So those items are in play right now. The next priority is maintaining and improving Galt's quality of life. Uh, the first task or the task, task listed here is ex complete the Galt market plan visionary document. And so we did explore additional utilization of the market property. The visionary document was presented to council on January 18th. Staff was directed to begin holding workshops on July 19th, 2022 uh, to discuss possible implementation. And so we will look to have those um, workshops either at uh, the last meeting in July or the first meeting in August. Uh, the next item is the uh, completing the phasing and funding of Walker Park improvements. And the Walker Park improvement plan was also approved, uh, presented to council on January 18, 2022. Uh, council gave staff the direction to continue efforts to bring the plan to fruition. Exploring additional hours and types of operation for a weekend market. And for those folks who were here on Saturday, you saw a grand example of this uh, goal, the strategic task coming to fruition. Uh, the council approved a pilot Saturday market on January 18th and February 1st, 2022. We had the first initial market uh, last Saturday. It was very, and I do mean very well attended. And I was pleased as your city manager uh, I believe members of the council were also pleased uh, to see so many folks there. I, I talked with the staff and a couple of the vendors had to go home early because they sold out so quickly. We had a number of vendors while I was there who were selling out, who were looking to scramble to figure out what they were going to do. So those are all good signs and so I'm, I'm very pleased to announce uh, that strategic pa uh, task is uh, doing really well. Um, and exploring options to address litter abatement, with, uh, litter abatement within the city. And I'm on the next page, 6 of 13. Uh, the city council is currently deliberating a uh, proposed ARPA-funded litter abatement worker, and so we're working on that as well. Uh, ensuring public outreach and communication with the community. So our commissions and committees uh, continue to hold workshops and outreach meetings uh, prior to public hearings in order to engage the community. So that's our, uh, that's our um, strategy for um, improving the quality of life here in Galt. The next priority is city council roles. Uh, one of the strategic tasks was to target our council meetings to four hours uh, based on the start time. We're not limited to four hours, so we're more than happy to stay here until midnight, but we're going to target uh, four hours from the start. Um, council meetings since January 18th have averaged 2.5 hours per meeting since the adoption of the strategic plan. That would have been three hours, however, we had one meeting that was about an hour and a half, and that sort of skewed our average. So, um, so we are sitting at two and, a half, two and a half hours. Internal succession planning. So we've got recruitments going on for several positions, or I'm sorry, recruitments for several positions remain challenging as we are competing in the same region um, as larger higher page and payer agencies, paying agencies. Um, our human resources shop is often required to extend application deadlines or reopen recruitments. And um, so we remain hopeful as our finances continue to stabilize that we'll be able to make adjustments to compensation to make us more competitive. As far as building the bench in uh, calendar year 2021, we promoted from within 22 employees. Uh, from January through March of 22, uh, the city promoted from within nine employees. Uh, we've made great efforts to fill vacancies from within the organizations. Many times we've been able to convert part-time folks to full-time positions um, by posting the jobs internally. As far as growing our people and providing education and training, 
Uh, the Human Resources continues to offer employee training um, in various areas uh, from compliance training to soft skills training. And so under number three, we've listed a number of uh, trainings that we've provided during calendar year 2021, and that include anti-discrimination training, respect in the workplace, art of writing, um, the performance evaluation, um, accident investigation supervisor training, and cybersecurity training. From January through March 2022, public sector employment law update, uh, discipline in the public sector, uh, just various training opportunities that we provided our staff. And lastly, and this is the one um, that I'm pretty proud of, the city has enrolled two staff members within the, with management potential in the 21-22 Sacramento Valley Leadership Academy. And that academy has uh, attendees from all of the governmental agencies in this region. And so we've got two uh, very bright folks that show management potential uh, representing GALT in that program. So I'm very pleased. Um, redefine GALT as the city of GALT as a learning organization. So we've reinstituted the tuition and reimbursement program effective July 1st, uh, 2021. We want to help folks get through school. Uh, traffic mitigation, uh, staff completed traffic counts for and reviewed a Carillion intersections at Vauxhall and Lake Canyon as directed by council. Uh, staff made repairs and minor modifications at uh, pedestrian crossings. Uh, we've trimmed trees and reviewed all signage. Um, and so we believe no further action is needed at that time as far as making those areas safe. Uh, staff are in the process of procuring two speed feedback trailers as approved by council as well. So Public Works continues to keep our roadways as safe as possible. Uh, the second item listed there is uh, research of the feasibility of a preliminary evaluation of a quiet zone. So we inquired, we inquired with Union Pacific Railroad on the process and, invite, and advised council of the requirements and the estimated cost. Uh, we, at this point, advise no further action at this time because of the um, level of the anticipated cost. Uh, conducting outreach uh, regarding the requirements, uh, placement of uh, various signs in our community. Uh, we conducted a Traffic Engineering 101 workshop back in October of 2021. Uh, continuing our solution-based approach uh, to inquiries and requests, um, those efforts are ongoing. The next priority is housing. Uh, updating the 21 to 29 housing element and staff is currently working with the department, State Department of Housing and Community Development to develop our document, uh, which we hope will be certified by the state soon. Um, as far as meeting state housing requirements, uh, the city has submitted our 2021 annual general report, general <laughs> plan report to satisfy our state reporting requirements. As far as exploring uh, proactive partnerships to develop positive projects, uh, the city has recently approved the 172 unit Fairfield residential uh, for rent townhousing project. This project provides uh, housing diversity that has not been developed in Galt for over 30 years. Uh, this project helps meet our rental housing needs. Um, the next item is pursuing multi-generational um, family projects. City staff is working with home builders to develop these uh, develop homes with built-in accessory uh, dwelling units or accessory housing units and residential suite options. The priority for improving C Street, um, uh, we have not uh, endeavored in uh, moving these strategic these tasks forward since January. However, by the time that I come back to you in June or July, there will probably be some activity there. And uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, that concludes the update. Um, I did want to just hearken back to the last issue uh, just to make sure that Council knows that I, I understand and I hear them as far as the business plan for getting the ARPA dollars out to businesses. I, I did not get a chance to say that earlier, but I do hear you. And we've talked to Citrus Heights, we've talked to Rancho Cordoba, and we're also looking at Elk Grove, and we're kind of, we're learning about best practices for these cities that have rolled out these, these programs before. 
they also have more staff that they can throw at it. So Amy and I have to be more stealth and more uh, efficient about how we do this. But we want to definitely understand how the others are doing it. So I wanted to let you all know we hear you. Okay. And that uh, concludes the update on the strategic plan. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, do we have any public comment on this particular item? No public comment. Okay. Um, do we have any questions for um, or comments for Mr. Hines on um, the strategic plan update? I, I just have um, a real quick item. Um, as far as the uh, tuition reimbursement, don't need to answer now, but is there a way to get a, um, the policy and or the MOU language that addresses that just for, I, mean, I don't, again, don't need it right now, but um, just so we know kind of what that entails. Sure. Our human resources director, Stephanie Van Stein, will be happy to provide that. Okay. And then uh, the second thing is just really a comment. Um, I, I think it's important to bring the strategic plan to the community uh, in a quarterly fashion and as discussed before. Um, I think it really outlines uh, what work is going on um, currently and uh, what the future looks like. Um, oftentimes in government, um, you know, we, we always wonder what they do behind the, under the dome or behind the walls of City Hall um, and why why um, things are prioritized the way they are, and and I appreciate our uh, the the strategic plan coming because that's really the doc the document that we as a council have said this these are the priorities, and so um, appreciate that, and I hope the public um, uh, was able to hear it and uh, and and certainly give input to us as 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 we move forward uh, as to what the priorities are, and so thank you for all the work. Um, Mr. Hines, as well as the rest of the staff on um, the movement on the on the strategic plan. I mean, it's tons of work done, so I appreciate it. And that's it. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hines. Uh, give us a good report. Uh, the only thing I would like to make a comment on the economic development. And we all know Amy Mendes, she's doing her best because she went out there to the convention, she talking to the developer, and she know what developer, how the developer can be in success. Uh, you know, our, especially last time when we uh, reduced the fees on a uh, infill, on a housing, uh, and then we also, uh, ask uh, if they can bring back with the commercial. Uh, I do understand uh, she's working or staff working on the fee deferment program. There are a lot of city uh, uh, is, is doing the same way I believe uh, we are moving forward. And I also like to mention to the staff or because we do have a little bit problem in the city infill small lots. And we know when somebody tried to develop a half acre, quarter acre, two acre, five acre, instead of somebody developing a 20, 50 acre, they have the same fees, almost equal. If you're developing a half acre, this can be $100,000. And traffic study is the same way. So in this city, there are a lot of lots, small lots. We have to find a, some way I'm just requesting with my constituents if we can do something so we can have an infill project gaming. I talked to some of the developers, they have a half acre, and their, some of the, their fees is very much as compared to the 20 acre. If any developer is developing a 20 acre, he pay $100,000 for CEQA. I don't think so, my opinion, have any problem. But if somebody going to develop a half acre, two acre, and they're charging almost the same money, it's not that much difference. It is a problem. So that's I would like to, you know, mention something. Uh, I talked to some developer. They have a small lots in this city. 
and do something because there's comparison. Even even if they bring any project, I know I don't want to be, you know, give up any money from public works department impact fees. I don't want to give any money from the uh, other department. But at the end of the day, if that person bring the project, he's stuck with that. Then we can we can might be a little bit lose in the front end, but we can get that money back. And as I like to mention, thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Councilman Vandenberg, you come up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think I think Papa's and Wings is a good example of that. Is, is we help them out, and instead of an empty building, we have a, a running business, which is really good to see. Uh, I like what Councilman Lozano said about bringing this to the public. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's not often enough, or maybe it's it's better that it's doing it this often. Excuse me. <clears throat> And I don't want this to sound like dogpiling. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but thank you, Ms. Rodriguez, for bringing up the topic of the businesses. It's in the same vein that I spoke last week about the parks and recs. Those are both areas where there's a tangible sacrifice by the citizens of Galt. And, and I, so I'll just cut to the quick. What, what is the timeline we could expect? So the timeline, because we're also um, working on a budget right now, too. Yeah. So that's why I'm anticipating this. We will be rolling this out uh, by late spring because we've got to now that we've gathered best practices. Now we have to come up with a program that fits GALT, but also has the integrity of those other programs. And so that's what Amy and I have to put our um, that's what we have to sort of wrap our heads around and start designing this program. There's also, uh, you know, the actual implementation, the intake, and so we have to figure that out as well. Um, so that's going to take a minute because I'm juggling that and uh, pretty significant budget issues as well. Um, as far as the number one category, parks and recreation, um, Director Solis presented me with a proposal uh, uh, last week uh, that I will probably be bringing to you on April 19th, which utilizes ARPA funds for the replacement of playground equipment. And so that'll be coming to you. It is significant. It will most likely take most of the park's allocation that remains. It is of, of the ARPA funds? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it is significant. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> I had a few comments, but I'm going to cut down a little bit on them. Just um, I, I want to say um, thank you, for Paul, for bringing that up because <clears throat> it is true that we do have some infill uh, on that particular subject. Um, I was noticing items four and five on our on our strategic plan. Um, number four is meeting the state housing requirements, but staying flexible for other opportunities. And number five is explore proactive partnerships to develop. Um, so those two things make me think of, of what uh, the vice mayor was speaking of. And I also know that um, recently uh, Mr. Hines met with um, some people in the community that are, have a project they're trying to, they're trying to get going. And, and I got a report back on that that they had an initial meeting and it seems like there's some, there's some positive energy there. And I'm looking forward to hopefully you know, seeing things like that. Those are projects that I think could fall squarely into proactive partnerships or flexibility for opportunity, so I like to see that. Um, uh, a couple other things, just kind of touching on some subjects. I was very happy to see, uh, you know, Mr. Liz, I, I totally agree with what Rich said. Um, you know, this is a living document, as it's always stated, and to bring this back to us so that we can look at it and see what the progress has been made so that not only uh, we, but obviously the public, can see what we've done, but also for us to look at it, and, 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 and again, a living document means that it it organically you know, these are the goals we've set, but things kind of do, uh, you know, fluctuate within this, this sphere of these things from time to time, and I, and I like the fact that we revisit them. Clearly on the uh, staff, on the education, training, building the bench, all that, there's been extensive work done, and I'm happy to see that because that is one of our, um, our plans. But with that being said, I also, you know, I know there's no certain priority to any of these. Uh, like, you know, there's not like one, two, three, four, they just all exist. I do really want to see, you know, want to reiterate the importance of some of the other things, like, for example, the traffic mitigation. Um, you know, traffic is probably one of the top two things I hear the most from people. 
And I'll be honest with you, the reason we probably don't hear more of it at council meetings is because you know, people like myself and other council members are heavily engaging the community on social media, uh, answering their questions and telling them you know, that we're doing this and we're doing that and this and that and answering why we don't have additional motor officers at schools and, you know, and, and explaining you know, the situations that a lot of, there's a lot of information they don't know. Um, <clears throat> so we're out there in the front lines you know, fighting on this. But this is a priority, and I feel like I would like to see, I would like to see more done on the, on that front because it's what I call a small town problem. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not drive by shootings. It's not serious things that other cities might be in, uh, experiencing. But it is it is a big important thing to the community of Gaul, and, and people talk about it a lot, and uh, and I witness it on a daily basis. And so I just really want to, uh, I just way the way I read this, it kind of was like. You know, we did that. We don't need any more action on that. It kind of seemed a little dismissive, like, you know, like we're kind of done with that. Check that off. Check that off. But I don't. I don't think that we're anywhere near being done on what can be done on that on that traffic mitigation. So I want to keep that in the spotlight. As Mr. Uh, Sandu, at our safety meeting, it was you know talked about at great length again. It always is. And then the last thing is on, um, you know, the. Uh, I, I I appreciate the. Uh, you know, I know we're working on some ideas for uh, the fiscal sustainability for the market, which kind of falls into the other item under here, uh, which is the uh, identified secure sustainable funding for parks. So that's kind of uh, kind of re uh, redundant of that. But um, the last thing is um, is the uh, I'm looking for it. So bear with me a sec here. Well, that might have been it, but uh, anyways, I do appreciate everything that's been done so far and all the progress that has been made. It's good to see all these, um, but I also want to, uh, you know, make sure we keep moving the goalposts forward on these other ones that that are just as important. Because, like uh, Councilman Vandenberg said, it's great to see that we're doing things behind closed doors. I mean, the city, uh, the, the citizens can see all the work that's being done that they don't optic, they don't visually see. But as I said at the last meeting, people are visual and they're like, "Great, we're doing that. Great, we're doing that," but how come my grass isn't getting mowed on my landscaping and how come, you know, this isn't being done over here and people are visual. And I think we need to um, remember that we all work for them and they're, they're the ultimately they're, I represent them. We all five of us represent them and by proxy, the staff represent them. So that's all I had to say on the, on the strategic plan stuff. So thank you. Does anybody else have anything before we wrap this particular item up? I just have one one last question. Just a general reminder: uh, How many businesses are in the city of Galt? One twenty-seven, thirty, about two hundred. Two hundred? That many? Okay. Thank you. I usually have Amy around to give me that information. <laughs> All right. So, uh, no further comment. Public comment on this item, Tina. No public comment. Okay. All right. Well, with that. Um, so we are just receiving an update, so we don't need to take any action. So we will be moving on to our next item, which is going to be item L3 from the police department. The subject is AB 481, Military Equipment Use Ordinance and Policy for the Police Department. It looks like our report is going to be given by um, our Lieutenant Small, actually. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Yes, uh, uh, Lieutenant Kalinowski, or I'm sorry, now Chief Kalinowski, i got to get used to that, um, is... Uh, out of town um, on some uh, work-related business, uh, so he's asked me to stand in for him this evening. So uh, it's an honor to do that before you tonight. Um, <clears throat> on September 30th, 2021, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a series of policing reform legislation into law. Uh, these laws are aimed at increasing police transparency, and AB 481 in particular requires law enforcement agencies to now adopt military equipment use policies prior to taking certain actions relating to the funding acquisition or use of military equipment as defined by law. The policy must be adopted by ordinance at a regular meeting of the governing body for that agency, which is why we're here tonight. The law now classifies and deems certain police equipment as military equipment under AB 481 and is designed to provide greater transparency to the public. It's important though it does not establish or give local agencies any new or greater rights to this, to you, the use of this equipment, it clearly just—it's uh, more of a, um, a transparency type action, uh, so that the public and the council knows what equipment's available to us um, that's defined as military equipment under this uh, bill. 
AB 481 requires adoption of this policy before the law enforcement agency can take action to request military equipment as defined by the statute. Or proposal for, or, I'm sorry, uh, proposal for or entry into an agreement with any person or entity to seek funds for, apply for, acquire, use, or collaborate in using military equipment or acquiring military equipment through any other means not specifically detailed in the statute. This introduction and first reading is a first step in the approval by City Council. This item will be heard for final adoption on May 17th, 2022 at the regularly scheduled Council meeting. Once approved, City Council will be asked on a recurring basis to hear and approve an annual review of this ordinance, as well as approve any annual military equipment report that discusses whether equipment has been compliant with the provisions of AB 481. Each annual military equipment report must be made publicly available on the police department's website, which we're planning for right now, uh, for as long as the equipment is covered by the report, is it, by the, as long as the equipment provided in the report is in use. The report will be first presented uh, to the Public Safety Committee consistent with the draft language in section 710.9 of the law. And so um, uh, this evening um, we're uh, recommending, um, we're asking the council to introduce and waive the first reading by title only of a proposed ordinance adopting the military equipment use policy pursuant to AB 41 for the Galt Police Department. So I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment? No public comment. All right, if you do want to make a public comment on this, you're welcome to star nine on the phone or a speaker sheet. Does any council have questions for Lieutenant Small? Uh, just uh, Mr. Small, just very quick. As uh, you know, that's AB 487. This is signed by the governor, right? And I believe they're going to identify the military equipment each city have it or, or they use it, right? And City of Galt, we do have, we're using that uh, equipment. Can you might we describe which equipment or is it not? Yeah, it's it's in the, it's, it's attached to the report. Um, some of our rifles um, qualify under um, military equipment. Um, some of our breaching tools um, for um, gaining access to locked buildings uh, qualifies. We've also included all of the equipment listed under Elk Grove Police Department's policy because we have a joint SWAT team with them. So in a SWAT type situation, um, their, their um, SWAT team in, with our, our members on that team would come down here and operate. And so we've included all the equipment for them as well in anticipation that those types of um, events will happen in the future and that will be um, under this legal, we've, we've complied with the law in regard to the use of anything that Elk Grove uses. Thank you. If I may. So if I <clears throat> understand you correctly, we will, go, the city of Galt Police Department will have things on public record that they may not actually have possession of, but because it's a joint use, such as the SWAT that you mentioned, that's required. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so anything we can anticipate reasonably to be used in the city, um, we, 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 we have to kind of comply with and provide information. Mm -hmm on that because we have that joint Elk Grove um, MOU for the SWAT team, um, it's reasonable that we would expect that. But that equipment would not necessarily be housed at the Galt Police Department. Right, which, which also helps reduce cost. Correct. Thank you. I, I just have a, a more comments rather than questions. Um, you know, I, I took some time and read through uh, the process that this bill went through AB 481. And um, one thing that I learned is that this is not equipment that is obtained by the military. It's, it's equipment that's military in nature as defined by the state legislature. So I, I think that's important to, to point out because um, oftentimes the governing bodies don't um, don't identify, they wouldn't identify necessarily things that, that are military um, that the general public would think it are not, right? And so, uh, so that's one piece. Um, the other is, is there's no reimbursement uh, from the state for putting this policy together or the time and energy uh, that it takes to um, do an annual report. Um, 
and so I don't necessarily um, agree, and I just want to get that on record, that I don't necessarily agree with this, this piece of legislation. Um, uh, in fact, the author is no longer in office, and here we are uh, implementing something that, uh, that is interesting. Um, I, the, 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 the interesting piece to me is going to be how this is going to affect officer safety by publicly disclosing items um, in which our officers are faced with critical incidents. Um, and and I'm, this is just a scenario, right? It's not every piece of equipment, but I really can anticipate, anticipate some people, or bad people, may not know what a flashbang is. And here we are now educating um, the, the, the general public, which is okay, but the ones that are uh, out there to do bad stuff um, are going to get an education on tactical equipment uh, that's being used. Um, I don't necessarily agree that it's for transparency. I think it's for a uh, reduction of police control uh, for the, by, the, by the chiefs. Um, so I just have to say that. Um, I certainly am going to support staff's recommendation on this because we, we need all the tools we, need, we can get for our officers. Um, but I don't necessarily agree with um, the state's um, intent and, and or how this was developed. So, um, and, and I'll say that, you know, Galt's a different place. <laughs> and so, uh, but I, I, I am looking forward to the mandatory public meeting that we're going to have at some point here in the near future about uh, that the law requires us to. Um, did I mention there was no reimbursement from the state? So um, I appreciate the energy and time that the chief has put in and, and, and everyone in the department's put into this, and I will support it today. Um, but I do have um, some significant concerns with the legislation. So thank you. Yeah, I would like to echo everything he said. <clears throat> I too struggled with why I was like, I just struggle with why we would want to, I mean, we're not talking about tanks and I mean, that's one of the things, but that's not, you know, golf's not rolling around with tanks and, and clearly it's, it's policymakers deeming uh, something as military just because, you know, just because golf PD has a five, five, six rifle and the military uses a same caliber rifle. Now, obviously that weapon that, you know, is considered uh, military, which is, it's just, it's the same thing I guess you could call when you start calling things assault weapons and it's, you know, it's a loose term. It's a loose uh, adjective, but um, yeah, to have a list of things like to say, Oh, Galt PD has this many rifles and, and this many, this, and this many, that has this. I mean, I don't understand the purpose of that. I mean, some of you say transparency, but it's like, it almost would be like, where do we stop? Do we at some point for transparency start saying, well, this is where we're going to have our police deployed in the morning. They're going to have two officers over here on this street, and then over here we have to give a running schedule where our officers are going to be at any given time. I mean, it kind of works towards the criminals instead of the citizens, in my opinion. So, yeah, again, I support it because we have to, but I just think this is more government overreach. I think it's virtue signaling, in my opinion. And um, so that's what I have to say about it. Does anybody else have anything to say? You guys are both right. This was born out of the defund movement and so the purpose is not transparency the purpose is to uh, take it away and they failed at you know being able to do that um, some of those people might think twice uh, given what happened Sunday morning four blocks from their offices um, but yeah I know you're right that that is the that is the purpose and you know, and not only can people go on and say, well, this is what they have, but hey, this is what they don't have. They can compare agencies and see uh, who has less stuff, and maybe that's a good place to target. So, um, yeah, it's useless, but I support going forward with the uh, Lexapol language to keep us in compliance. All right, uh, any other comment by council? Uh, public comment? No public comment. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll be looking for a motion, excuse me, a motion to introduce and waive first reading by title only of a proposed ordinance adopting a military equipment use policy pursuant to AB 481 for the Galt Police Department. 
So I move. Moved by Councilmember Vandenberg and Second. seconded by Vice Mayor Sandu. Can I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Papineau. Aye. Councilmember Vandenberg. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Farmer. Aye. Approved five to zero. Second item up <clears throat> from also from our police department. We're on item L4 for those following along at home. It's going to be the unmanned aerial system UAS proposal. Mr. Small. Well, speaking of AB 481. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so the police department has identified the need to purchase and deploy unmanned aerial systems in order to provide more effective enforcement of the law, decrease risk to officers, and to utilize technology to offset the impacts of having a, limited, having a limited number of officers deployed in the field. UAS programs have become commonplace in law enforcement throughout California, including the Sacramento region, and offer a substantial improvement in our, in our ability to effectively enforce the law and improve public safety. The UAS can be used to assist in the apprehension of subjects who may be attempting to evade law enforcement, assist in locating missing persons, and provide improved security at special events. It can also be used to assist in locating evidence, processing crime scenes, and during vehicle collision investigations, uh, the last of which I, I've had a, an opportunity to talk to my counterparts and in significant um, vehicle collision investigations, um, they're cutting the time to a quarter of what it takes before and providing much more accurate measurements. So um, in that respect and in the other respects I mentioned, um, this tool's incredibly valuable. Um, to give you a little bit more about its use and some of the specifics, though, uh, I'd like to turn um, the microphone over to Detective Young Hammock. Uh, as part of our leadership development program, he identified this as a need for the police department, and he's basically um, seen this project through from the beginning till where we are today. So uh, I want to recognize his efforts for that and then allow him to uh, provide some additional information about the program. And once he's done, I'll come back and uh, provide a little bit more information, and then we'll answer any questions you have. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so he kind of gave a br brief rundown, so I'll try to be brief on that and not hit on the same things that he did. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so like he mentioned, um, I did some, uh, some research. I talked to other agencies uh, and kind of identified that this was pretty important. It's pretty relevant. Most agencies around here are using them, and they're, they're very successful. Uh, they're not intrusive, and they're very helpful for, for public safety. Um, so... A little bit about me, how I got this thing started. You can go to the next slide. Um, I've been with the department almost eight years now, so three, almost three years actually now as a detective. So um, I have a little bit of experience behind my belt. Um, I've got some experience with rail patrol vehicles and stuff. So was, I, I know how these things work. I actually own a drone. So prior to actually implementing this, I am very familiar with them. So once we do the, launch this program, I'll be the point person. Uh, to, to facilitate any training or, or anything like that. So um, I found a course down in Huntington Beach actually that did a post-certified drone pilot training. So it actually covered all of the, uh, the, the policies that need to be put in place, some of the, some of the things that we need to look for, uh, some transparency type things that we need to look at for public. Um, there's, other, there's a lot of options I'll kind of cover um, briefly later on in the slides. Um, so I'm an FAA certified drone pilot, so I actually took my FAA license. So I do have that. That allows me to fly commercially, so it doesn't get us in any kind of tr legal trouble. Um, and I can fly an aircraft under 55 pounds. The ones that we're looking at are only like two to three pounds, uh, depending on some of the equipment that you can add to them. So um, the, the, there's drones out there that are much heavier and much bigger that kind of pros, uh, propose a little bit of a, a, a safety issue, depending on where you're flying it. These don't really have that, uh, and some of them you can even fly indoors when we talk about some of the mini ones. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, Lieutenant Small mentioned a couple of the things that we have for uh, public safety life preservation missions. These are some of the operations that we would use it for. Um, the biggest, you know, one of the biggest things is pub, uh, officer safety. So, um, you know, a lot of times we have to call for air support if something happens. We, we have two officers and a sergeant on at night. Um, and sometimes we can't even get air support. So if something really big happens, uh, we're kind of, our hands are tied, and we could barely set up a perimeter. So something like this, we could deploy within minutes. Um, we could have live feed up. We could have thermal imaging up um, and really help uh, not walk into a bad situation. So um, that was kind of the driving force of this, and then there's a bunch of other things that kind of go along with it that, that help us out and, to be more effective. And um, you know some of those are investigative scenes. I know the, the accident reconstruction is huge. Uh, there's some 3D modeling software out there that's uh, 
very comprehensive and very detailed, um, and I'll cover that in a minute. Um, so some of the other stuff, the, the search and rescue type stuff, if we have a missing person, like I said, with thermal imaging, if it's at night, um, we could get on it right away versus having to kind of wait for some daylight hours or, or you know, get caps to come out to help us and do things like that. So it really like uh, reduced the amount of time that it takes us to, to locate people. Um, some of the other things we could use, special events, uh, you know, some of the parades and stuff that we have, um, you know, we could even live stream some stuff if we use the right software. Um, so we can do some, uh, some stuff to integrate the public with it and, and kind of show some of the cool things that it can do. Um, and then mutual aid type stuff too. Um, you know, if we have an agency that asks for us that's close by and they don't have a drone available for some reason, um, and we have one available, we could, we could go help them out. And I'm sure they would do the same for us if we were in that situation. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, like I said, there's going to be some policy stuff. So uh, some of the things that, that have to be in the policy are, are, you know, the UASs will not be weaponized in any form. Um, and they won't be used for any type of random surveillance activities. We're not going to just fly them over people's houses. Um, that, that's not going to be allowed to do. It's got to be mission-based. Um, and, you know, this is some of the language that has to be in, a pol in the policy, too, about uh, targeting people based on uh, individual characteristics, uh, whether it be race, ethnicity, uh, the religion or anything like that. So um, that language has to be in there. And then, you know, we can't conduct any business other than official uh, business. So we're not going to be using them for uh, anything personal. You can use your personal drone for that, not the city drone. Uh, you can do the next slide. Uh, so some of these are some of the options that we have. We're looking at the, uh, the DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise. Uh, it's about $7,000, um, which includes uh, three batteries and a controller and everything. Um, so that one's kind of a medium-sized drone, like I was talking about, about two, two and a half pounds. So um, it's got a very high-quality picture camera on it, 48 megapixels, got a 32, 32x zoom on it. Um, and this one actually has the FLIR camera or the thermal imaging camera with the 16x zoom. So um, the, the thermal imaging picture that you get, even in the nighttime, is, is very high quality um, for a drone this size. Um, one of the things mentioned here was Axon. Uh, Axon Air uh, um, offers these particular drones um, through their software. Um, what that does is kind of sync with our camera systems, um, and you can live stream with it, uh, download it to uh, evidence.com, all, all the data for it. So that kind of gives a little bit of capability. I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's some costs involved with it. I think they're, they're like $900 a year per pilot per year, so um, we'll weigh the cost of that, but that's an option. Um, another one is the DJI Mavic Mini 2. So uh, some of the larger agencies are using these for interior flights. So if we're going to do some type of warrant service <clears throat> or if we're looking for somebody it's active, um, maybe dangerous, we can actually fly these indoors. Um, they'll have propeller guards on them so you can beat them off the wall if you need to. And they're super small. They're like the size of your hand. Um, and then you can just watch your screen and fly it through and clear the whole house without uh, even entering beforehand. So. Um, they're very good use for that, um, and, and my recommendation would get you know to be a, to get a couple of those. So, uh, you can go to the next next slide. And uh, another one of the options we looked at was the Autel. This one's like really an upcoming drone. They're a little bit more money. They're about nine thousand, but they don't have some of the limitations that DJI has. So DJI has, uh, as you know, is made in China. So they have some uh, some firmware updates that can can come out continually, and then there's some some geographical locking that happens depending on if you're in airspace or not, where you have to get some type of uh, clearance basically through DJI before you can fly the thing. We'll even turn the propellers on. So a lot of agencies are going to this Autel because it doesn't have those limitations. So it's something to look at. There's a little bit more money and, and the quality is, is pretty equal, uh, maybe a little bit more runtime in it. And the thermal imaging on it actually is a little better. I got to play with it down at Huntington Beach. So uh, it's a pretty awesome setup. Uh, and I just put in there some of the other options that are out there just to show the cost difference. Skydio makes a drone that's uh, the, it's got really good autonomy, so you know you can f it's easy to fly basically. But the camera is not good, and the reception is not good, and it's about double the cost of everything. Um, so not not at the top of my list, but this one of them that's out there that people are using. I can go to the next slide. And then this th this would be like on the higher end, the DJI Matrice. Uh, this is some, some of the bigger agencies are actually clearing calls with us and, and flying them right out of dis, you know, from dispatch. They'll, just, they'll get a call, they'll dispatch the call, the drone will fly out and go straight to the call and, and hover until cops get there or even clear the call if they don't need to, any cops there. 
Uh, but these things are probably 25,000 plus, um, but you can carry payload with them. I think Amazon is actually might use some of these for, for small packages. So, But this is another popular uh, drone for law enforcement that, that's out there. So I just wanted to show you guys so you can kind of see some of the options that are available to us if we ever need something like that. Uh, and go to the next slide. Some of the cool things about the DJI, um, and, and the Autel has them too, are some of the attachments. Um, you can put a spotlight on it where you get like 2,000 or 3,000 lumens of light. Um, there's a speaker on them so you can make announcements from the drone. Um, and then, the, you know, they have like a beacon on it if you have to fly in certain conditions where you have to, it's actually become an FAA requirement where they're all going to need it eventually, but you'll need a blinking light so it's, it's um, kind of like identify as an aircraft in the air. Um, so some of those are pretty cool, and even Autel has like other attachments where you can put like a cage on it, and you can do all kinds of attachments, more lights, and and all kinds of things. So um, even grappling hooks, grappling hooks is another one. We we actually pulled a, a gun off a roof um, using a drone, so it was, it was kind of fun. So uh, you can go to the next slide. All these come with a remote. Um, the DJI is a little smaller, five and a half inch screen, but it's built in, so we don't need a tablet, we don't need a phone. Um, everything's built in the remote, and this this comes in the package of the, in the prices that I mentioned. This is this comes with it. So um, the Autel one has a bigger seven inch screen, almost eight inch screen, um, and they're very high quality. So there's no need uh, to buy phones or tablets or, or have to deal with those um, in any of these packages I put together, except for the Mavic Mini too. Um, but we could use one of our department issued cell phones for that if we need to. And go to the next slide. Um, some of the things that you know I never really thought about until I went to the class um, was a you know having like an aviation communication radio so you can hear if there's incoming flights in the area, so um, you can limit your your altitude if if you are in flight somewhere where you think uh, an airplane might be coming in, or if we have air support, say we get a helicopter from SSD or CHP that comes in, uh, we could listen to their air traffic and then you know communicate with them so we don't get in their space. So um, it's like 250 bucks for uh, one of the cheaper Yazus, which is what most people use. Um, so that's as a consideration to have something like that. Here I mentioned the the, the claws and the hooks. Uh, just the cheap things on Amazon actually work really well. So um, with some options, anti-collision lights, FAA is requiring all of those. Um, so that's kind of like the blinking light on it. Um, I'm sure drones in the future will have them built in, but right now you can just pretty much put a battery-powered one on there and take off. So um, another thing, one of the details is remote ID. Uh, they call it a license plate of the sky, basically. So what it does is it transmits uh, identifiers to let um, air traffic control know that, hey, this drone's in the air right now, and this is its loca location. So um, right now you can buy a separate add-on. Going forward, all drones will have to have it, and that's required by FAA. Um, so I'm hoping by the time we order these, it may have it integrated so we don't have to buy any extra equipment. So. And then another FAA requirement is propeller guards. Uh, you can't fly these things over, you know, commercially over people and stuff and at night without propeller guards. So it's a safety thing. Uh, if, if you get into some situation and, and unfortunately hit somebody with it, at least they'll have prop guards on it and it won't cut them up or anything like that. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So this is the data management stuff. Uh, I talked about the Axon Air and the cost. Um, so that's out there. Motorola makes some CAPE software that's out there. Air Data makes some uh, software. All this stuff, what it does is um, it allows live streaming. Um, Air data is pretty cool because it actually downloads everything off the drone and, and logs it. So everything from your battery usage to your flight inputs, it literally shows like what inputs you put in your controller. Um, and some agencies are even posting this stuff publicly on their websites and stuff, so it's uh, very transparent. Um, even the map, it'll like Air data will do a flight map. So if you put it up and you do a perimeter with it and land it, it'll show that path. And um, so some agencies are doing that just to show the transparency of just, depending on the city that are in, they may, may be more uh, sensitive to than other cities. They, they do do that. So that, that capability is there. Um, there's a small cost with it. Air data is like $20 a month, uh, which isn't much. And I think they're based out of El Dorado County. Um, the Motorola Cape software, that one's expensive. I think that one was like four or $5,000. And then, like I said, the Axon Air is um, a per year, $900 per year type of recurring cost. So um, things to consider. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the 3D mapping stuff I talked about. Um, that picture is actually a, a, a model, a 3D model, I think, from Pix4D. Uh, so what the drone does is it goes up in the air, it talks with the software, you say I want it to, to scan this area, and the drone does it all automatically. It takes pictures and videos and pieces all together, builds this 3D model. Um, so like Lieutenant Small mentioned with the accident reconstruction, we can completely reconstruct that scene 
even a whole street with, with a drone, and it would build a full 3D model of it. And then you could go in and manipulate it, put in measurements, vehicles, uh, placements, everything. So um, not only cutting time down in half, it's, it's extremely accurate, and, and there's no guesswork. Um, it's very factual data that it puts out. So, uh, Pix4D is about $5,000 for a one-time purchase. Uh, Skybrows, I think they, they, you can do a $99 a month, or you could do a $4,000 one-time purchase. So some of those things um, are things to consider. Skybrows is kind of cool because you could actually do it out in the field. Um, if we were going to go out on a perimeter or something like that, we had a, a subject that was locked down in the backyard. We could actually throw it up, say, hey, map this real quick, and it'll map the entire uh, yard, house, everything. And you can even say, you know, this is how far this person is away from me. This is how high they are. Um, so you can really lock down somebody um, based on that. So. And that can be done within minutes with that SkyBrow software. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Next slide. Uh, so to operate one of these, you got to have a, a licensed pilot like myself. So um, you know somebody would have to go to, to the airport and take the FAA test and, and get certified to fly one of these. Um, the visual observer, that's usually you have a second person with you to kind of keep eyes on the drone, so your line of sight. Um, it's not a requirement, but it's recommended, um, just depending on your staffing that day. Uh, the good thing is, if you have a visual observer, my license works with that person. So as long as I'm standing next to the person flying the drone, they're, they're operating under my license, basically. So there, there's some um, uh, flexibility there for who can fly it, uh, as long as a certified pilot is there on scene. So um, I mentioned the COAs in this, but they're kind of actually going away. Uh, we don't have controlled airspace in Galt, luckily, so we don't have to worry about any type of approval from air traffic control or anything. Um, so I have a map, uh, an app on my phone that I could pull up and check. And I mean, I think Lodi might be the closest one with the, the, um, the skydiving place. Uh, other than that, it, it's up in Sacramento. So we're, we're pretty clear here. Uh, FAA waivers went away too. Uh, we don't have to apply for any waivers as long as we have uh, the propeller guards and, and uh, all the proper equipment. Um, we could fly at night without any restrictions. We used to have to apply, apply for a waiver for nighttime flight, but there, that went away. So. Um, and that's the, the weight restriction and the, prop, the prop guards. So, uh, Next slide. Uh, so the training and upkeep, um, obviously I've put together a training program uh, for continual training. Um, it's recommended you at least fly like a battery a day if you can, or at least every week, um, just to keep the battery um, charge, discharge going. And it gives uh, the pilot the opportunity to, to stay familiar with the, with the, with the drone. So. Um, we'll do some formal interviews for, for this because we'll have, uh, you know, I don't know if it's going to be four or five pilots, hopefully, so we have some versatility there, but um, not just anybody's going to be allowed to do a program. It's gonna, somebody has to show proficiency of some sort. We can't just have anybody flying, so we're going to be uh, aware of that. Um, and then we'll probably get some visual observers. Some of the ones that maybe aren't ready for flight yet can do a visual observer for where they can, they can at least get familiar with them. And I think the more people that get involved, the better. It's kind of like a canine. If you don't work with a canine, you don't know what to do around it. Same thing with the drones. You don't work around them. You don't know exactly what to expect. So hopefully we can get some good integration into this and, and implement this. So um, the maintenance on them is pretty, pretty small. Um, you just basically check the propellers, make sure there's no cracks or nicks or whatever. If there are any, there, there's no sanding or fixing or whatever. You just toss them and get new ones. It's not worth the risk of having a prop come apart. So um, that's one thing to consider. And then the batteries. Um, they do last a while, but they, you know there will be a replacement time period, uh, and depending on how often they're used, the heat that they're stored in, things like that. So we'll have to take that into consideration. Um, otherwise, the software firmware updates um, and just functionality checks. So we'll log all this stuff. There'll be a log of all the maintenance that's done on it and all the checks. Um, so we can keep track of it. So if there's ever any questions, um, if, if something were to happen, if a drone were to come down and cause damage or something, um, we, we would have a good tracking of everything that we do. So. And I think that is it. Anybody have any questions for me? So much cool stuff, so many questions, but I won't go into all that. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I think just trying to think of what questions the public would have um, outside of all the cool um, things that it, that, that it does is um, what, well, I think you covered some of them, but I think I initially had jotted down, what is it not going to do? And you mentioned this isn't, we're not just going to deploy this thing to fly around to look for like, you know, a code enforcement issue in somebody's backyard or or whatever, this is mission-based only when these are deployed, correct? Correct, correct, yeah. And you know, if it was a situation where we needed a warrant, 
uh, we could get a warrant if we need to get into some space where we're thinking it, it might be a privacy issue, right? But yeah, it's not. We're not going to take this thing up and fly it over a neighborhood and go. Oh, that might be a weed grow, and then go. So I mean, people's civil liberties still apply. You're gonna, not going to fly one of the Mavic Minis into somebody's house unless you have like a search warrant to enter the house. Yeah, it. That would be an exigent circumstance where we're actually actively looking for that person for for a major crime, or if we have a search warrant and, and or you know arrest warrant going in. The other question I have is how often <coughs> these things get damaged in the line of duty, but I think. You know, regardless of how often that is, if you got a six hundred dollar mini drone flying in a house to look for a suspect and he comes out and whacks it with a baseball bat, I mean, better that than an officer take an injury and then that could just be, you know, could be a long term thing and who knows. Um so it has so many advantages. But um insurance wise, I mean obviously we probably the department would have some sort of insurance should something happen to one of the drones if you know, incident with the drone and then, I mean, just normal insurance type procedures would apply, I assume. I, and this is just a new realm, so I'm just trying to think outside the box here. And I know I talked to Lieutenant Small about that. I don't know if you have any details on it, but there, there is an insurance that covers it, correct? The, the, yeah. So uh, there are two different insurance questions, um, you know, liability insurance. So if we're flying it, it drops and somebody gets hurt, obviously. Um, we've, we've priced out that insurance that's included in the fiscal impact that I'll, you know, share in just a, a few. Uh, but then... Um, the, was that the insurance you're referencing, or, were you, or, or I mean, yeah, just and then replacement costs and, and whatnot. Um, you know, if there's there's insurance available for you know if one goes down needs to be replaced, the cost of that from what we've seen so far is pretty high. Um, it's something we'll look into, um, but you know the the reliability of of the vehicles um, coupled with the training that we're going to provide the officers. Um, I'm optimistic that, you know, we're not going to have issues of, of major uh, catastrophic needs for replacements. Um, but if they do come up, we'll, we'll have um, some contingency in place, whether it's insurance or, or some other funding in place. Um, part of the fiscal um, analysis we did includes replacement costs every four years. Um, I don't anticipate that we'd need to. The, the lifespan of these uh, products are longer than that. Um, but that builds in some cushion, again, just in case. We do have one go down. There's some monies available for repair or replacement. Okay. Yeah, it's. Uh, I have a friend who has a Mavic Mini, and um, I've been around it a few times. It's phenomenal, the stuff. So to think about the the scenarios that could be used for that, especially the uh, 3D modeling, I really didn't have ever thought about that. But if you could recreate a tr crime scene and then... You know, instead of having maybe like three or four people out there measuring with the little wheels and all these things, you could have it mapped and you could go back to the department and build it and input, you know, trajectories of a bullet or whatever. I mean, I guess the possibilities are endless to recreate an incident. I mean, I can only imagine how useful. Um, so to be clear, this this funding you're at, the direction you're looking for tonight <coughs> is for the council to provide direction to bring back some sort of budget a number and this funding will be coming from Measure R, our, which is our um, half cent sales tax um, public safety fund. Yes, Mayor. Um, because this is a new program um, that improves the operability of the police department, uh, Measure R would be used to fund this project. Uh, we're looking at an appropriation of approximately thirty thousand dollars. And this amount includes the purchase of the equipment, which would be two of the um, the the mid size drones, the, the six to $8,000 drones, two of the minis, um, the required insurance software and training for one additional pilot. And so that would set us up um, in that two year cycle. Um, and then if we were to add additional um, pilots, um, sustaining the program at two pilots is approximately $10,000 a year. Half of that though is the built in replacement cost. So it's not that, ex that expensive of a program to run, uh, but because the cost of the equipment, you know, we want to have that replacement in place. Um, we're trying to earmark out those dollars. So again, like you mentioned, if there is a catastrophic incident, one goes down, there's the ability to replace it. And then ongoing annual costs of approximately $4,300 per pilot. That's primarily because we have to insure each pilot, not, not just each aircraft. And uh, training, um, in-service trainings, um, any other uh, potential costs, uh, the, the cost, as we add more pilots, there's more video recordings 
which means um, potentially more uh, need for data storage and those types of things, even though um, whether we use the Axon product or not, um, we'd still use evidence.com, which is the Axon uh, database for, for storage of all the video for this. So there might be some uh, cost incurred there, but it wouldn't be substantial. Okay. I just want to, you know, just say to the public, this is another good example of Measure R. Should this should this be moved, should this be pushed forward? Um, you know how, how how good Measure R that that half cent, which is such a low impact on the community, um, makes such a huge difference. We fund, you know, officers, dispatchers, SROs, graffiti abatement, all these things that people don't even realize that come out of that. The body cameras you guys are wearing now came out, partially came out of that, I think. Um, this would be another example, and just to know, you mentioned 40, 30,000 is the? 30,000, yeah. yes, sir. And so I think this last, from our budget, Measure R brought in like 2.3 million this last time around. Usually it brings like 2 million, but it was over, yeah. So it's, it's a good amount of money that, that the people voted to be used for public safety. So, I mean, that's what, that's what it was earmarked for, and that's what we need to be spending it on, and that's all questions I have. So does anybody else? I, I have a couple. <clears throat> oh, just curious. Uh, if you'd consider, you know, crop dusting, considering we're a farming community, if, if and when that can cause any problems, because it's been a few years, but my understanding is crop dusters actually don't have to submit a flight plan either because they stay below altitude, correct? Yeah, we kind of cover that stuff, and that's, that's a lot of the line of sight. So um, technically, FA requirements is three miles line of sight for, for the distance you can fly a drone. Um, so, you know, we should be able to see an aircraft coming at that level. You know, if you hear a prop airplane or whatever and you're flying, you should be able to look and see it and be able to lower your altitude. Obviously, they have precedence over you no matter what you're doing, so you need to get out of their way, whether that means land it or go up higher or whatever. But, um, yeah, there, there's really no, unless you have some type of direct community, there's no communication because there's not going to be any air traffic, so you got to be aware of what's going on. Okay, and then you, you, I think you just actually touched on it. I was curious, um, the streaming video would be integrated into the existing system and secured, like it's not going to be the hackable or anything like that, right? That depends on if we choose to do that. So, um, you know, it would be a direct connection to the drone, obviously to the, to the controller that you're flying it, and that's secured, um, so you can't really hack into that. Um, if you use Axon, that's secured, just like our body cams are. Uh, but there are options out there to publicly live stream if you wanted to, um, and those, those are some of the software programs I talked about. But, so there are options are there, but generally your normal flight, yes, it's secure, and you don't have to worry about getting hacked. Okay, and is there any, uh, it's kind of a personal curiosity because I'm an electrician, you know, the old DeWalt batteries, they die slowly. The new lithiums, they just drop dead on your batteries. They just stop working. Does, is there like a low battery return function on it? Yeah, there is. So um, what it does is it, it actually will check, check to see how far it is, the drone is away from your remote. And when the battery percentage drops low enough, it'll detect how long it needs to get back. And so if it gets to 20% and it says, hey, I need to fly a half mile back to you, it'll, it'll calculate that and actually it'll tell you like, hey, low battery, it'll beep, and then the thing will just come home automatically and land with battery left, a little bit of battery left. All right, right. Excellent. Thank you. Not really questions, comments. I appreciate the presentation. And um, this, like many things, is starting to become somewhat of an industry standard. Um, and I'm kind of a amazed hearing uh, almost daily, there's not really a tactical situation that lasts more than a couple, five minutes, that there's not an application for it. So I certainly appreciate it. Um, and obviously I'm inclined to support it. Um, and you're talking about two pilots. Uh, that's a good starting point. But you know, I would suggest uh, once it's up and running, uh, get to the point where uh, we're always gonna have somebody on shift that can do it. So, thank you. I just have a, a point of clarification. Uh, most of my questions were already answered, but in terms of um, where it can go, is it fair to say that the drone can go wherever an officer is legally able to go at that particular time, whether it's through a warrant or, or that, anything like that? That's the idea, correct. Okay. So it's, it's, it's basically, um, in place of us, so it, we're not going to put it somewhere where we wouldn't be able to go. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the live feed, is that, um, you touched on it, you talked about uh, maybe an extra expense, but are you thinking that that live feed would go into dispatch or to the MDT at some point or something like that? 
I just I mentioned it because the capabilities are there. Um, just like our cameras, I think you're able to pull it up on your phone and live stream them together. Um, and that's with Axon. So that Axon cost would include that. So you could pull up the drone feed as well in the same manner. So whether that streams in a dispatch or, or a cell phone or an MDT, yeah, that, that capability is there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the presentation and the thoroughness. And I, I suspect you've uh, checked in and, and consulted with the, the agencies that are nearby that have programs. Uh, I happened to, at one point, had a, the opportunity to see the Sheriff's Department uh, utilize their their drone in our parking lot at work, and uh, it was pretty cool. You know, they um, do little PA announcements off of it, and uh, so it was, it was a good good deal. Um, again, appreciate you putting all the time and energy into this, and, and uh, whatever you need, I think, um, at least from my perspective, you know, uh, whatever you need that you believe is is reasonable that you may need in the next you know five or ten years let's let's do it now and get you what you need in terms of the uh, accessories and things like that uh, so that we're not uh, behind the or you guys aren't behind the eight ball operate them someday soon you know so it's uh, that would be my druthers is that uh, we get you what you need now so thanks uh Thank you, Mr. Hamill, all your time, all your time give us a good report. Thank you, Mr. Small. Uh, there's report in the detail. Uh, I'm going to support that operation. Uh, you know, this is a good thing, uh, safety of the officer, and there is human on the report, a lot of good things. Uh, just for the clarification, uh, you mentioned you talked to some other agencies. And if you can say which agencies you talked to and how long they have that program, um, I think it was, uh, so down, when I was down south, I met some of the, the southern agencies, so Huntington Beach was there. Uh, there was a couple of, I, I can't remember the exact uh, uh, Bay Area agency that I was, I was working with, uh, but I also talked with Old Grove, too, because they have some pretty uh, extensive program. Um, but Huntington Beach uses, uses them a lot. I mean, they, they have their actual air support, but they probably use their drones more than they use the actual air support. So. All right, and there is any agency around our neighboring, our Grove, Florida, Stockton, any other neighboring city using that program or not that they might be ready? Um, I, I think I, I think Lodi is using them. I haven't talked to them about it. Uh, Stockton, I know, has a program, and San Joaquin County might um, be, I don't think they have it implemented yet, but I'm sure they're looking into it. I know Sac County uses them extensively. Uh, Elk Grove has a, has a really good program um, and a lot of cool equipment. So. And uh, the other thing on the report, uh, there is uh, some prohibited use. And then I, I know this is, I like the program, but we want to make sure our citizen understand, uh, you know, this program is not somebody's privacy violation because we understand there is a very fine line between the safety of the officer and the privacy violation. So we want to make sure whatever you mentioned, we do not cross that line. And, and I think that could be covered um, by attaching it for a call for service, right? So the times that we have it up, we'll have, there will be a call for service so we can tie it to it. Um, and then if we decide to do those, those maps where they, they record our flight path, um, we can make those available to public if you wanted to, or we could have them at the department uh, attached to report. So there, there's options out there to be transparent um, and, and make sure that we don't run into those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is just another tool, you know, that we use uh, in addition to the plethora of other tools that we have. Um, but the rules of engagement still apply regardless of what tool we're using, right? Protections under the Fourth Amendment, uh, unlawful searches and seizures, um, that all applies to this as it would any other piece of equipment. So um, all of our policies have to comply with our current search and seizure policies. Anything that has to do with this must comply and fall under um, uh, existing case law regarding the Fourth Amendment and, and our existing policies. So no, it will not be used um, in a violation uh, in, in that manner in the same way that we train our officers not to violate the Fourth Amendment um, using their vehicles, using um, their bodies, anything else. So, um, and that's obviously um, usually the number one concern in talking to people who who have implemented these programs and that's always the community's concern, right? All of a sudden I've got this a uh, little mini aircraft filming above my house or above my business. And obviously that is a concern, um, but there are um, safeguards in place that would prevent, you know, the, the violation of anybody's civil rights using this equipment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Small. Thank you for explanation to the public. Thank you. That's all.
What is just one last quick question? So, what timeline are we looking at here? So, if we were give if you were given direction tonight, or if we give direction to to um, our city manager to um, allow you to come back, what kind of how we're looking for? How, how long are we looking for you to come back with a with a number that we can approve, uh, or is that part of the tonight? And then, how long will it take to purchase? So, I'm looking for like from tonight to deployment. How long are we looking at? Uh, luckily, uh, Detective Hammock's done um, all the work up front, so um, I think we've uh, pretty much narrowed down the product that we want to use and we think's best. Um, and so, really, what we're looking for uh, from the council tonight is direction back to staff uh, to include the cost um, that we've we've highlighted into the um, budget build um, for the next budget. Uh, and once that's um, appropriated, then we can make the purchases right there. I don't know for sure. Um, if uh, the companies that we'd be purchasing from have any delays due to supply chain issues or, or whatnot. Um, so that might impact our ability. Um, but in terms of readiness, uh, it's, we have a policy ready to go. Uh, we've identified the product. It would just be getting the product. Um, Detective Hammock can already fly. So really, um, from receiving the product and adopting the policy, he could start flying day one unless I'm, unless I'm missing some. So then he'd just be getting other pilots trained at that point. So piggyback on what Councilman Lozano said earlier, um, where he, yeah, again, he was kind of implying on making sure that you know you get what you guys think you need. The number that you're asking for, you think is sufficient to get all the things that you're you're looking to need. I'm sure there's some other stuff you'd like to have, but I just want to make sure if we give you direction that you have the the money that's necessary, or you're coming, you're not coming to us with like the bottom of the barrel number. You're you you've, you're confident with the number that you're. For the equipment, um, for the two drones, we think that's sufficient for now uh, because we want to build out the program um, thoughtfully. Uh, we, is, there's no sense in having equipment that we can't use based on the number of people trained. Um, so I think we're, we're comfortable with the two larger drones and the two smaller drones um, initially for equipment. Uh, our, our, I guess if we were to... Um, if, if the council's suggesting that we, that there might be ways for us to build the program out um, better right now, um, my suggestion would be to maybe add additional pilots. Uh, because with the two drones, that's enough to deploy and cover us what we think, um, based on our calls for service, pretty well for a while. Um, but again, if we only have one pilot, we just got to hope that that critical incident occurs while that pilot's uh, here. So, so um, what, what would that cost be? Um, with the training um, and then the additional um, cost for... Um, the insurance and the the other items listed. I think I think I scoped out about forty three hundred dollars per officer. So an additional. Um, so if we had uh, Detective Hammock, one more built into the thirty thousand. Um, if we were to you know do another four more at four thousand, so say, you know sixteen seventeen thousand dollars more, and that'd give us six pilots and five patrol shifts. And so schedules change, but that would, that would give us a better deployment model in terms of better coverage with the drones that we have. So Mr. Mayor, if I may, yes. um, council has the option tonight to direct us to bring back a rezo at the next meeting with an appropriation in it. Um, so what I'm going to pitch, um, subject to uh, Lieutenant Small's uh, direction, um, is that perhaps we bring back a resolution with an appropriation at the next council meeting for 30000 to get this going so they can order the equipment because the supply chain, we just don't know. And then as far as building out the program, the PD can include the build-out in the 22-24 budget and so all that becomes implementable um, as of July 1st. So it's April now. We appropriate. We buy. We order. And it might take 90 days to get it in play. Hopefully not. Um, and then by the time 90 days elapse, they're ready to not only deal with the equipment or use the equipment, but they're also uh, will have funding hopefully, depending on how the budget goes. But this is Measure R, so it's a, it's, it's a little different. Um, so they'll have equipment, and they'll also have funding in the brand-new fiscal year to build out the program and get additional pilots. Oh, but, but you get that, you have that time to order the equipment. That's what I'm worried about. How long is that going to take? Yeah. 
How long does it take to train additional pilots? What's the time frame on that? Honestly, to get certified to fly it, it's it's a, it's a test that you take at the at the airport. So you could, you could get certified in a day. Uh, the class I took was a was a forty hour class of one week. Um, you know, so that's that's ideal. But if we had to, we can get a pilot uh, certified to train right away. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I, I agree that we we're waiting for equipment. But I was thinking in the in the interim period where you're waiting for equipment, if they have if we had earmarked funding, they could use some of that. If we had earmarked say additional funding f up front with this initial. Um, with this initial uh, uh, direction, to uh, they could start, you know, they could get additional pilots trained and already have them ready to go when the equipment arrived. I'm, I'm what I'm suggesting is I would be comfortable with going more than thirty just to have that there, just to save cut through some time. But I, I'm game with whatever the council wants to do. <clears throat> I have a quick question: Is the training post reimbursable, or is it outside of post? I don't know for sure. Most training is not post reimbursable anymore. They've tied up on that. So I'm assuming probably not. Uh, the post reimbursable courses are usually the ones that are required by law. Okay. And, 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 I, and I'm with everyone else. If the, the, the sooner that we can get it into your hands, I think the better. And I think as soon as you can start the process to, to include other officers through a formal process that you mentioned. Uh, and get them trained, I think, the better. So I, I, my suggestion would be similar to what the city manager said, um, but to bring that back maybe next time and you know, with an outline of what that would look like and, and what you think it would take to get people interviewed and, and, and done. I, I second that. Do we need to vote, or is a consensus good enough? Sounds like we have a consensus. All right, so I will work with the Galt PD and we will come back with a proposal and have it on the April 19th agenda. Okay. Okay, that worked for Do we everybody? have any public comment on this item? I did not ask for that yet. No public comment. Okay. That worked for you, Lieutenant Small? Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Officer Hammock. Thank you, Lieutenant. Detective Hammock, excellent job, sir. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, well, finishing out the night here. Moving on to our item M, communication. Do we have any this evening? None this evening. All right, item N, city clerk's report. Uh, none this evening. All right, thank you. Item O, comments by staff. Mr. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't have any particular comments, um, but uh, count, uh, Community Development Director Craig Hoffman, do you have any comments for the group? And uh, the other directors who are hearing me are on their way in to give their comments. Tonight I'd like to brief you on your favorite subject. On Monday we did get a letter back from HCD identifying that our proposed changes meet their standards. So I'll be looking to bring that back to the council. I know it's a, turning into a journey. And I know how much this council is committed to providing a wide range of housing opportunities that meet the needs of our community as well as those in the region. But we'll be bringing that uh, back to the council to to get that adopted and, and meet our certification needs from the state. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Next up, Economic Development Manager, Amy Mendez. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Um, just briefly wanted to update you on a new community engagement um, platform that we're gonna be integrating into our website. So Granicus is the host of our website and they have a platform called uh, Gov Delivery. And so we'll be phasing out the constant contact, connect with Galt newsletter and moving to the new Gov Delivery platform, which is actually integrated on our website. Um, we'll be using it for the agenda delivery, but we also can use it for newsletters and announcements um, from all departments. There's a text messaging uh, capability as well. And so when you go to our website pretty soon, you'll have a pop-up box that comes up, a dialogue box, um, asking you to sign up for city communications. So PD will be able to use it, parks. Um, if we have any emergencies, we can text message out with uh, updates to the community. So that'll be within the next few weeks, we'll be transitioning that. And then did want to touch on the um, business assistance programs. I just briefed 
Lorenzo, really quick. Um, I did meet with the chamber on the 10th of March to kind of talk about programs that we were looking at uh, modeling this through. We met with Rancho Cordova, we met with um, the city of Citrus Heights, and we also have talked to Elk Grove and trying to put um, a program together that models um, some of those and getting, um, as Lorenzo mentioned, some of the best practices to make sure that we um, don't have any issues with the businesses when we do go. One of the hiccups that we've heard and a lot of roadblocks have to do with the application process and documents that are being required. And so we want to make sure that um, this is something that we can actually qualify businesses for and we don't have any of the um, issues with um, documentation and making sure that businesses are easily able to apply. So we're working on that right now. We also have the nonprofit program that we're trying to bring together on the same evening. So I believe we have that scheduled in May on the 17th. And so I've communicated with the nonprofits. I've talked to quite a few of them who've been asking about funding and when that's gonna be coming forward. We'll be pushing that out. Um, we're gonna to try to get some feedback from them to make sure that uh, the program that we are putting forth is going to be something that is um, helpful to them. And we're also looking at, with the business assistance pro program, trying to um, incorporate home occupation as well to make sure that we cover that um, as part of the program. And so in addition to meeting with the different cities, um, we also have a financial consultant we've been talking to. One of the um, problems that Rancho Cordova ran into is businesses really being um, concerned about supplying um, financial records to the city because it is public information. And so we have a third party consultant we've been talking to about reviewing those records so they don't get submitted to us, they go to a third party. And um, so we're working through that right now. And hopefully we'll be able to um, have actually finished the program for the business assistance. I'm working on the nonprofit right now. There's guidelines that have to be put in place, an application, we've got to update the website. There's a lot that goes into it. So it's taken a little bit of time, but I'm hoping to meet with the chamber within the next couple of weeks to go over the program that we've drafted to make sure that um, it's effective for them and for the businesses that they represent. So if there's any questions, that's all that I have for this evening. Yeah, thank you for all your work on that. And I think our comments by no means didn't want to imply that we didn't think that anything was being done. It's just that we've been getting a lot of pressure from our businesses asking questions over and over. So we're just relaying that on. And so I'm glad to hear that. We're be clear. Thank you. No, no problem. Yeah, thank you for being proactive and researching in other cities. It sounds like you found out some really good information to help this businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Human Resources Director Stephanie Van Stein. Yes, good evening. I just thought I would advertise that we have uh, several vacancies for lifeguard right now. We're gearing up for summertime already. Um, it's a great opportunity for students or anyone who's home during the summertime. The uh, minimum requirement is to be age 16. Um, we do have information on our website for the Red Cross and CPR certification requirements as well. So if everyone could uh, pass on the news. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Parks and Rec Director Armando Solis. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, have a few things to report on. The first is our, our SOAR program, Schools Out Academic and Recreation Program. Next slide, please. So in, um, in 2012, the school district cut back on busing for their students, and they asked us to bridge that time between when the parents got home and after school. So we created a, uh, our SOAR program, our after school program. Well, the school, recent, the school district recently got a grant to provide their own after-school programs. So they'll be providing them free of cost to their students at our SOAR sites, which means we no longer have a site to operate at or need to. Uh, next. Um, but we will still be keeping our SOAR, uh, summer SOAR program, which will run uh, during the summer months. So the first full week when school's out up until the the last week, uh, we'll operate that at Fairside School and utilize the pool of Inventorids Field uh, during that. Um, if you had any questions, I'd be glad to answer them now, but I wanted to make sure you understood that uh, 
This is not a decision the city made. This is a de decision that uh, the school district did. Um, you know, and it's a good one. They received uh, grant funding for this program and uh, now they can um, staff it. Is there any, is there any significant fiscal savings? N not a lot, no. Th this was one of the few programs that was basically a wash. Okay, thank we, you. We did not lose any money on it. Uh, I don't have any questions specifically um, about this. Just uh, just wanted to say while you're up there that I was very pleased with the market. I didn't get a chance to talk to you after the morning because I know you had a family event, but um, was very well attended. I think it was an awesome time. Spoke to so many people that day and even people coming in, uh, you know, to my place of business uh, after and uh, and throughout this week since Saturday, uh, or last couple of days. Um, Real positive feedback. I have heard nothing negative. Um, just a couple of things. Hey, it'd be nice if we had blah, blah, blah. But, you know, just positive feedback. But I just want to say thank you. Of course, I've expressed to your staff already. But to Jackie and, and Ashley and everybody who's behind the scenes, there's so many people, I'm sure, I know that we're very pleased with uh, how it went. Can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was ahead of you there. Oh, I'm sorry. I asked for questions, but now the next one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to talk about the Saturday oh, market. Ahead, That's all right. Sorry. We're just on the same wavelength. There we go. Uh, so this last Saturday, we had our uh, first Saturday market. We had a touch a truck event along with that. If you can do the next slide, please. Um, here's a couple of pictures of some of the merchandise that we had and the kids climbing on top of what looks like a dangerous picture um, of them in the back of a, a cow waste dump truck, but they were monitored. Uh, people were there with their stuff and keeping an eye on the kids. Um, so uh, we believe there was well over a thousand people that attended. Uh, we'll get a better count at the next one. Um, we had um, over 40 vendors um, and we believe that it was a very successful market and Jackie and her staff did an incredible job uh, running that. And then uh, the next one. Uh, we're already planning our next uh, Saturday market, which we'll, we will be celebrating uh, Cinco de Mayo and we'll have live music, uh, the Mexican dancing horses. We'll have some uh, dancers there. Um, it's going in a car show. So we, we hope to bring back the same amount of crowds. And we got uh, positive feedback from our vendors. Two of our food vendors sold out completely and several, several of our vendors uh, sold out of product. So we're really happy with uh, what we're doing and um, I think that we can make this successful. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you guys had any. Thank you. Uh, I noticed, I, I spoke to uh, some of the vendors, citizens, uh, staff, people, someone from the police department, uh, and there was a heavy participation in the morning, early hours. I was there from 12 to 1, 1 1.30, whatever, did it continue to taper off? And the reason I ask is I'm wondering if, you know, we pay attention, should it uh, shift even more towards the morning hours as it gets hotter? Because, you know, I certainly don't want to walk out at a 110 degree day and walk in the sun. Yes, towards the towards the two to three o'clock hour, it was the slowest time. Okay, so it's just something. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I it was uh, is better than I expected to be honest. Uh, which is really good to hear. You know, it's a lot of good feedback and stuff, uh, but there's no reason to try not to improve. You know, uh, oh, no, we're we'll, we're taking notes. We've already had a debrief. There's things we can improve on, and um, you know, we will be continuing to improve on the event. Okay, great. And then, uh, what's your gut feeling? Because you got the vendors. Well, we got a good amount of vendors. Don't get me wrong. But we want more. And what's your gut feeling about ex expanding that? Because as this was brought to the city council, it was brought at a small loss, which, you know, a negligible loss, which was a reasonable risk. You know, what's the odds of expanding that so that it's uh, a gain? I'll be able to tell you more in May it, to see what kind of momentum we got from the vendors. Because what they'll do is... The best advertisement is those vendors talking to their friends, saying, yeah. come down to this market. We did really great. Right, I sold so, out. Yeah, so I will tell you probably in June where, we, where I think we're, where we can go with this. Fair. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think the vendors, it, you know, any skeptics are going to be like, wow. And, and I think that it's going to be the buzz that's created. Um, and that'll just, you know, organically feed into more people wanting to participate. I, too, had a good friend of ours who's a, who's a vendor, and uh, and uh, I was helping her pack up at the end of the day. And she was saying she's like $600 of the product. She said uh, she's a, she doesn't even do that well at the street fair in Lodi. So uh, definitely... Uh, Went really well to answer Jay's question. I it was like about ten, about ten fifteen, ten thirty. Really was like, like really packed. Um, I would say, and then about one thirty, it started to taper, uh, as it started to get a little warm. So um, about noon, dead noon, it was probably you know, the maximum. So, anyways, I've already said everything. There's nothing left to be said except that it, great job. Hopefully, we can continue on and and we support, you know, what you've been doing. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Finance Director uh, Matt Boring. Good evening. I don't have any updates today. I didn't. I didn't bring a slideshow like Armando. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't put on a successful market, so I'm sorry. We didn't. Yeah. We don't get to. But you look great tonight. Your suit looks oh, great. Thank you. Your slideshows okay. usually put us to sleep, so yeah. we appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I did your favor then. <laughs> A lot of love in the room. Uh, let's let's go with Lieutenant Rick Small. <laughs> I'm afraid to come up here after that. <laughs> um, the only thing I'd like to uh, just remind everyone is that um, the last week of April is the um, Sacramento Police and Sheriff's Memorial. Um, and uh, our officer, Harmander Grewal will be enrolled um, at that site um, on that date uh, the following week the first week of may uh, will be the state memorial um, and then uh, i think a week or two later um, the uh, national memorial and we're sending out several of our staff to participate in that as well so um, if you haven't received something already um, you'll receive something from us shortly about those dates and an invitation uh, to attend um, and again it's a it's an open event so anybody's um, who wants to attend um, show the respect for the two officers who local officers um, who will be enrolled at that time, our officer, Harbinder Greywall, and then um, Deputy Adam Gibson from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. Um, so everybody's uh, encouraged to attend. So, thanks. thanks, Rick. Let's go with uh, Public Works Director Mike Selling. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Uh, a couple of quick updates. Uh, the banner program, the Great American Little Town uh, Galt Banners, uh, that program is, is basically sunsetting, and our staff will be uh, taking down the banners probably over the next month or so. Uh, you know, it's kind of filler work uh, in between their normal uh, duties and, and whatever, you know, uh, more urgent matters may come up. And uh, they'll be returned over to, uh, to Dan and, and Tony, and I think and they'll be distributing them back to the businesses so, they, so they'll get them back. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is after the State of the City, uh, we uh, uh, joined with uh, Bonnie and, and a couple others, uh, and, and Dan, I think, or Tony actually it was, um, and going around uh, to look at uh, locations where uh, the herd on the street cows uh, can be located. So we uh, identified several locations for that. So stay tuned, more to come, and I think the, the buzz is uh, going to be starting. So I don't want to take too much of Bonnie's thunder or anything, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, we're working with them to, uh, to get that uh, program going. So that's so, it. Thank you. Mike, we still have the military better program is still in, in place, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, the military program is an ongoing perpetual correct, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, that concludes staff comments. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Not yet. Oh. We have City Attorney Frank Splendario. I have nothing further to add of consequence. <laughs> Nobody cares and, about the attorney. Look at that. And, and uh, of course, City Clerk Tina Hubert. I have nothing. Thank you. All righty. Mayor, that concludes our comments. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to uh, comments by City Council members and future agenda items. We'll start with uh, our Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, all the staff, uh, all the directors, and uh, Mr. Hines doing hard working and give us a good report. I also like to thank you 
public comments. Uh, I also like to thank you, anybody be here in this chamber spending that much time to listen to the council. And I have a few more things. Uh, uh, I get the opportunity to attend and spoke at the state of the city. And Mr. Hine gave a good, well detailed report on the state of our city. I also like to thank you other staff member director, they gave the report on that day. I also like to thank you mayor, given his mission uh, what he's doing and what he already done on on the on the city side. Uh, I was very shocked and ex extremely sad after hearing of passing of Mr. Bell Forrest. I had talked to him very recently before hearing the unfortunate news. I would have never expected that would be our last conversation. He was a very hardworking dedicated man and brought a lot of his experience when he joined our city back in 2006. My thoughts and prayers are with his family and loved ones. We will miss him dearly. I also attended Saturday market this past weekend. I was very happy to see so many people come out and enjoy themselves. There was great food, vendors, music, and weather was so great. I'm glad we were able to do the public outreach and get feedback on what time would work and that we made some adjustment. Many folks I spoke with at the event were very happy and with the time slot. I was very, it was very successful. <clears throat> Thank you to Mr. Solis and his staff. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilman Papineau. Yeah, so first off, uh, and most important condolences to uh, Bill's family and his city family. Um, I certainly always appreciated his straightforward, no-nonsense uh, talk to make uh, things even simple enough for me to understand and uh, the humor that he delivered it with. So uh, it's just tremendously sad. Um, and also condolences to the uh, innocent victims and the uh, families of innocent victims down in Sacramento and a hats off to the, uh, the first responders, the police department, CHP, sheriff's department, the fire department. Um, it's been a fast moving investigation and if you follow the news there's uh, something new uh, every time you turn around so um, you know hats off to all of them in dealing with that uh, tragedy and uh, on a brighter note yes the market was awesome uh, I had a great time out there my wife enjoyed all of the flowers and stuff that I tried to help the vendors sell out so congratulations to the staff on a great success and uh, Looking, looking forward to, uh, to seeing that grow because uh, it definitely seemed like there was some, uh, some enthusiasm for, for uh, vendors to, to come back and uh, for it to expand. So that's all I have. Thank you, Councilmember Papineau. <clears throat> Councilmember Vandenberg. Thank you, Mayor Farmer. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my condolences to the Forrest family. Um, thank you, Mike, for uh, selling, for coming up and saying a few words about him. Uh, I'm sure Bill would have appreciated much of the humor we displayed here this evening. Uh, it just always hard when people seem to just get stolen from me, you know. Uh, to the public comment, thank you for both, uh, thank you both, all the public comment. Uh, I encourage more people to do it. It's, it's one of the easiest ways to speak to everybody involved all at the same time, and it's uh, often an opportunity missed. Uh, congratulations to our local FFA. They uh, did well recently. Uh, it seems to be a continuing trend in Galt. That's good to see. Uh, and when it comes to the drones, I'd love to have a demonstration for the city council when it arrives. Uh, I enjoyed today's meeting. I had a good time. Actually, one of the best times I've had since uh, being elected to city council. Thank you for the opportunity from the citizens to do so. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilman Vandenberg. Mr. Lozano. Yeah, just um, also, I'm just gonna repeat a couple of things that have been repeated, but um, it, I think they're needed. Um, uh, condolences to Bill's uh, wife, Diane, and their family. Uh, he's certainly going to be a huge loss, and and I know um, the city staff is is struggling with it right now. And so, um, I, I, condolences to them as well, and and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll be able to get through this uh, as a team. And and so I appreciate uh, the information being passed on to us as soon as I was able to. And so thank you for that. Uh, also, uh, to the innocent victims down in Sacramento over the weekend um, and their families, it's uh, absolute tragedy and, and uh, certainly something we don't uh, ever want to have happen, but certainly not this close to home as well. So, um, And then on more of a lighter note, um, I was unable to attend the market. I was on a, a pre-planned vacation in the Midwest, and uh, but I want to say like Kevin's wife, my wife was down there helping the vendors sell out as well. And I, I, we have this thing on our phones and I can tell when, when um, our accounts during weird hours, not weird hours, but unusual hours for us are being used and I was able to see that, so it was cool. Um, the uh, State of the City was awesome. Uh, I think everybody did a great job uh, providing uh, where we're at and where we're going. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the Kasuma CSD board meeting where they honored uh, one of our public safety committee members, Chris Chamber, for his time as a labor representative, and he's recently resigned from that. So uh, that was, it was kind of neat to see him get uh, recognized uh, by the board and, and his, his uh, uh, superiors. Uh, then also the um, street cleanup at Horizon Community Church. I know Vice Mayor was out there, and oh my gosh, uh, that freeway I think kicks up every piece of trash and throws it on our side um, because it's just it, there was a, quite a bit of trash. I, I can't remember the amount of of trash bags, but sixteen. Yeah, wow. yeah. So, uh, but it was good. Uh, we had a great great turnout um, and a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of trash, and so, uh, but appreciated the youth commission and the church and the beautification committee for for being out there. Um, attended the uh, fire station ground breaking for the CSD. It's a fire station up in um, Elk Grove, kind of South Elk Grove, that'll likely be servicing our our area uh, should our uh, the firefighters that work down here normally get tied up on a call. So. Uh, Council Member Papineau and, and Vice Mayor Sandy were there as well, and it was a great event. Uh, and then lastly, um, was able to attend the Cal City's legislative briefing and bill introduction. And it's early on in the session, but uh, there uh, will be some stuff I'll bring, bring forward to the Council just for additional um, information as we move forward in the process. But uh, obviously lots of... Uh, legislation regarding housing and things like that that we probably need to keep an eye on. So, um, and I think that is it. All right, thank you, Councilmember Member Lozano. <clears throat> uh, I too wanna to just thank people who made public comment. I appreciate the public giving their input and hopefully as we are now back to live meetings, we can have more and more people come in and participate in this process. Um, uh, Mr. Rodriguez and uh, Mr. Robinson, thank you for speaking and the rest of you for being here. Um, I too want to uh, offer um, again our condolences to Bill's family. I heard Mike say that he had a fabulous sense of humor, and I was like, that was interesting. I wish I would have got to know that sense of humor. He didn't seem like he was that type of guy, but it's like this you just kind of never judge a book by the cover. And I didn't have much interaction with him outside of the council meetings, so um, sadly, you know, there won't be an opportunity for that. Um, I was wondering, you know, if, if I could ask Mr. Hines if. And maybe this is already something that's planned, but um, depending on, you know, of course, with the permission of the family, but I would like if, it, if it's okay with them at some point, if we can post something on uh, city social media, some kind of respectful obituary, just talking about who he was and what he did for the city. And if it's okay with them, if you can 
I'll uh, ask Director Selling to communicate with the family and see if that's a, if they think that's appropriate. Yeah, if it's I just like you know the community to know more about him and and uh, you know how long he worked here and all those those things. <clears throat> um, I want to thank the church, like uh, Councilman Zano said, for doing the cleanup. I was not able to attend that day. Um, I haven't missed very few of those, but. Uh, I was glad to hear you guys made a big impact. I know that area is really bad, but thanks to the Youth Commission and the Beautification and the Horizon Church for doing that. And thanks, Craig. Thanks, uh, uh, my fellow council members, Lozano and Sandu, for being out there um, and being part of that. And uh, which segues me into just one last thing, uh, just a request. Um, and I probably could have just brought this to you, but since we're talking about it, I was wondering if it would be possible if we could, especially on council days, but... I came in today and there was there's a lot of garbage and trash around the front walkway into the city hall and I don't know who's doing it um, but you know there was Councilman Vandenberg and I noticed it and I just I just want the perception of our city hall to be the best it can and I don't know if it would be as easy as just having somebody do a little walkthrough before council meetings or I mean it'd be nice if we could do it on a daily basis but every time I come to city hall I'm able to find some something stuff to pick up and carry in and anyway so if maybe it's a small request, but it would be nice to take, you know, show the community how, uh, you know, prideful we are in our, our, our hall, city hall, our city hall. So with that, I will wrap up my conversation. Thank you everybody um, for attending and we will adjourn at, what is it? 8.55. Good night.